Hello, everybody, and thank you for uh, for joining this uh, first ever NSRG workshop. Um, uh, we'd like to thank also, uh, you know, uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors that they include the IS, the International Association of Sedimentologists, the Force Consortium in Norway, as well as Equinor, Lundin, Vor Energy, OMV, Neptune Energy, and uh, Aker BP. Uh, and all these organizations allow us to uh, organize these events um, and provide you with uh, all sorts of useful resources for free. Uh, so, uh, please take a look at the NSRG website and um, also subscribe to the newsletter. As I feel like a YouTube person, you know, like uh, don't forget to subscribe, um, but subscribe to the newsletter because this is where you'll get uh, information uh, firsthand before they will be advertised on any other kind of social media source. And uh, today's um, guest is actually Dr. Joe Kington. Uh, Joe is a software engineer at Planet Labs in Houston, uh, where he works on large scale processing of remote sensing imagery uh, after having spent several years as an explorationist at Chevron, uh, working in a wide variety of frontier basins. Um, Joe is a structural geologist and a marine geophysicist by background uh, who obtained his Bachelor of Science uh, from Tennessee Tech, his master from University of Alabama, and he graduated with a PhD from the University of Wisconsin. And uh, his academic work has predominantly focused on uh, understanding accretionary prison processes. Um, and so with that being said, I think we, I, will, uh, I will give you the floor. I will mute myself. Um, and I remember everybody, uh, both also in the chat, uh, that everything will have to follow the NSRG uh, code of, of uh, conduct. And I want to thank also my committee members who are here on the camera. You can see it's um, uh, Dr. Mikel Poetos Morde and uh, Dr. Uh, Lina Hedvig Line, who uh, helped me with uh, setting up this. Uh, this uh, workshop, but I hope you all of you guys will have fun. Uh, and thank you, Joe, again, for um, for agreeing to to do this for us. All right, I'm out. Have fun. Yeah, and, and thank thank you all so much for having me. Uh, thanks, Val, for organizing this, and thanks to the uh, Nordic Sedimentary Research Group for for putting this together. Um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity, and uh, I hope it's helpful for everyone. Um, it's it's um, it's a little different, so this is going to be. Basically, let me back up and uh, give a little bit of rationale before we get into the nuts and bolts of things. But there's a lot of tutorials online. There's there's a wealth of information about image processing techniques and scientific Python in general. But most of it focuses on applications that, well, it's not irrelevant to geology. It can be hard to see how to make the connection. So really with this goal, um, I wanted to focus a tutorial on geologic tasks. Uh, with the hope that it's, you know, it shows how some of these things can be applied. It's not meant to be fully comprehensive. It's not meant to um, give you all the background, but it's meant to, to I hope, uh, let you be confident enough to pull up some of the other tutorials and uh, dive into the libraries and just try different methods. Uh, you know, really the goal is to, to just get comfortable enough with a lot of these libraries to, to just try different options and, and see what works um, and, and give you some ideas on what can be useful. So uh, with that, let me back up just a touch and mention some things. Uh, just in case folks haven't found it, um, I, I posted the link, so we'll get to it in a second, but chat, um, we'll be using mostly Gitter here. So if folks haven't seen that link, um, it is somewhat easy to type and remember. So I'm gonna kind of mention it here. Um, I can, I guess, also put it in the Zoom chat, but um, yeah, let me just do that really quick. Um, just in case uh, anyone hasn't found that yet. So this is a little more permanent than, than Zoom's chat, and uh, it's also linked to the GitHub repository. Um, this way you can ask questions later in case you come across this tutorial later on. I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on things, um, maybe a little slow to respond, but it, it's also a good recording of any discussion. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just a little nicer than, um, than Zoom's chat, uh, and it gives us a, a way to kind of ask questions. Um, second is that the link for the repository materials, in case you haven't found those yet, uh, it's on GitHub. It's Geo Image Processing Tutorial, and there's also a link uh, from the Gitter page once you're there. 
Um, ideally, most of you hopefully have set up Python locally. Uh, it'll run a bit smoother if you have everything local. Uh, so hopefully you've already set things up. Um, I, I won't go through all the detailed setup. There's a lot of ways you could have approached it. Um, Conda is an easy one. Uh, but if you're just joining now and don't have it set up, uh, I would recommend actually using the, the binder uh, approach. So this will let you run everything in your browser. It basically spins up a server that, that you can log into and, and handles everything. The issue is that it's going to be slower. And if you walk away for five minutes, it'll close itself down and you'll have to start back over. Um, you can jump to where we are in the tutorial, but you'll lose any uh, changes you made. So uh, binder is very nice for those of you to haven't gotten things set up or have had issues, um, but just be aware that if you walk away for five minutes, it, it shuts itself down uh, and it will it will appear to still let you change things, but it won't be executing any code on the back end. So uh, it'll give you a little warning when that happens. Um, anyway, that's hopefully everyone's uh, got things set up. One note on questions, I will try to take questions. Um, I'm also, it's a little difficult with, with Zoom and the way things are, are spread out. So what I'll do is I'll try to stop uh, through each section and, and have a little bit of time to answer questions. Um, and then later on, uh, so there's gonna be two parts to this tutorial. Uh, first will be the tutorial itself, which is actually three parts uh, of that. But then there'll be a second part later on. Um, there'll be more free form. And that's a chance for, um, a lot of y'all to try working with some of your own data. I have a couple suggestions of data if you, and then uh, problems I'll mention in as we go through the tutorial, but then uh, uh, some new things I recently added, um, just a very quick image and kind of a, a brainstorming idea that, that if folks would like, we can, you know, if you don't have anything in mind to work with, uh, it's a good, uh, a good exercise just to play with and see what you can come up with. Um, so that's essentially the structure of things. Uh, for the tutorial itself, um, I'm going to go over a few different examples. We're going to work a lot with uh, some of the same data, and then kind of at the end, we'll move on to other data types. But the goal of this is to start with data that everyone's familiar with, uh, and that really the operations we'll do will generalize to a lot of different types of data. So uh, we'll start out with kind of uh, a seamount detection example. This is going to be using a digital elevation model. Uh, it's data that I think you know makes sense to people intuitively. Uh, and we'll just walk through a lot of basic thresholding and filtering. Um, a lot of these operations are ubiquitous in uh, any image processing. So these these show up all over the place, and um, it's a good way to to think about them with elevation data because it's it makes sense intuitively. Um, and then we'll also use that same data to look at kind of gradients, which again, are another thing is going to show up a lot. Um, we'll talk a little bit about hillshade just because it's an operation people are familiar with, um, and it's good to it fits into the, the gradient discussion. And we'll continue using that with sound of toe of slope, uh, and this is going to give you some kind of um, more focus on edge detection. Another thing that that shows up a lot in uh, in various image processing contexts. Uh, and then we'll move on to some other data sets. So we'll look at some aerial photography. Uh, we'll try to look at lineaments in that aerial photography uh, and show a few different ways we might, might focus on that. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll tackle something. In this last example, I, I really should have broken down into more pieces, but um, I'll show an example of, of actually trying to do some grain detection in a thin section uh, You know, with the idea that it, it's imperfect, but even with imperfect uh, segmentation, we can do some useful things. So that's essentially what we're going to cover. One thing I do want to back up and mention is that the goal of this tutorial and, and the tools I'm going to show is not to replace a lot of your existing workflows that are you know, semi-manual. Um, th there's a ton to be said for pulling something up in Photoshop and, and you know, working with it, manipulating it a bit. Um, you know, things, tools like Image J are fantastic. Uh, for those of you who don't know who, what that is, that's uh, uh, it's a tool set originally developed for microscopy and other things, but it's, it's a GUI um, image processing toolkit that's really incredibly powerful. Uh, I'm not here to replace those. I'm not here to say that you should always try to do things automatically. You quite often will want to digitize things manually, but there are a lot of cases where having these sort of simple building blocks, uh, they're not going to be complete operations, but you have simple building blocks you can snap together and run on a lot of things quickly. And the results are often imperfect, but there's a lot of times where imperfect quick results are very useful. Um, so with that in mind, that's kind of the, the goal here. And I mentioned kind of building blocks and, and I like to use the term Legos, but really these, uh, these different libraries, they are simple low level pieces that can be combined. 
And that's one of the things to kind of keep in mind is you may have a, a good intuitive sense for, I, I want something like this in Photoshop or something like this in ArcGIS. You can think about a lot of these operations. The libraries that I'm gonna focus on today can absolutely do a lot of those, but they're a little more low level. So quite often the thing you may think of as a single logical operation will be chaining together five or 10 of these. Uh, so hopefully this gives you that sort of uh, understanding of, of what the lower level methods are and how you can chain them together to make some of the higher level operations um, that you often think about. So we'll focus today on, on a lot of basic things for uh, scientific computing in Python. So Python, SciPy, NumPy, uh, that sort of base case. I'm gonna assume that most people are familiar with Python. Um, if you're not, that's completely okay. You can get a lot out of this without being familiar with the exact language or the exact libraries, but it's, it's easiest if you have uh, some Python familiarity. We're also gonna use a lot of NumPy methods that um, I won't spend much time explaining the NumPy nuts and bolts. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to answer questions on that, but it is, it's one of these things where uh, it's pretty easy to pick up, but if you haven't seen it before, it may seem a little strange. Really the, the bulk of the image processing stuff that we're going to be doing, um, and I have a typo in here I never fixed, uh, it's gonna be scipy.indy image, which is scipy's image processing components and not sklearn, sorry, that is a typo, uh, sk image. Um, so sk image is another Python uh, image processing library that's a little more, uh, has a lot more components to it. Scipy.indy image I emphasize a lot just because it's, great for geologic use cases because we can apply it immediately to 3D data. If you have an X-ray CT scan of a core, you can use ND image on that. Um, if you have a seismic volume, you can use ND image on that. Um, Socket image, SK image is a little more focused on 2D, has more advanced methods, but it's not gonna immediately translate to uh, three or 4D or 5D data. So it's useful to have uh, both for that reason. Um, <clears throat> I hope everything works here as far as Zoom goes, uh, but again, feel free to, to ask questions in, in the Gitter chat as we go. Um, one of the things I wanna mention is that if you're not familiar with uh, Scientific Python, there are a lot of great resources online that I would particularly recommend. Um, so if you're not familiar with it and you still wanna, you know, I, I encourage coming to this tutorial regardless. I think there's a lot um, you can see here that will be useful, but uh, honestly, SciPy Lectures is just a great overview of the scientific computing eco ecosystem in Python. It's a very good introductory tutorial that covers um, a lot of what I'm assuming people are familiar with, but it's just a fantastic um, uh, resource. I think uh, Nicholas Roger put it together originally, uh, but it's really grown a lot since then. And it's, it's just, it's a fantastic tutorial. Uh, for the exact libraries we're gonna be working on, both have uh, a lot of great tutorials you should really look at. Uh, Sapa.ND image recently updated the tutorial. It's, it's um, a really good resource. So I would always recommend looking at the official docs. Uh, and SK image has a, a very rich set of uh, exercises, tutorials uh, and documentation. And it's a really good place to kind of look through and get a sense of what some of these operations that maybe name something completely counterintuitive, uh, what they actually do um, in, in actual visual terms. So it's a really uh, good place to, to look through. Uh, so we're gonna go through this without looking at those docs in detail, but I really uh, encourage always pulling up the official documentation or some of these other great community resources uh, alongside. So um, whenever, whenever you get stuck or just wanna look at things, uh, it's very useful to be able to pull these up and, and just kind of browse through, uh, especially because they are visual uh, and it gives you a quick sense of, of what the operations are gonna be like. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna work with the, the digital elevation data I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're gonna to try to identify seamounts and uh, I'll talk through why we're gonna do this in a second, but it's hopefully a fairly easy to understand uh, task. So first off, there's a full standalone example of everything we're gonna do in the examples folder. Uh, so this first tab just loads that. This is, if you just wanna look ahead and get a sense of what we're gonna do, that's that. I'm not gonna run it because this will run everything and we wanna walk through it in smaller steps. But for those of you who um, may be more familiar with things, just wanna see where we're going, there you go. You can, you can see what we're gonna do uh, as we go through. But let's back up and look in detail at what this does. Um, so what we're gonna try to talk about today is one, the array representation, and I'll mention why that matters in a second. It's what makes this an image actually. Uh, then we'll look at thresholding, filtering, and segmentation. So 
let's load up our GeoTIFF. So this data is actually spatially located. Uh, this is a GeoTIFF format, so geospatial raster data, uh, which means we have a projection and a location uh, for everything in it. Now we won't use that right now very much. We will later on, uh, but I just want to mention, I will not talk in detail about the uh, geospatial input and output, but there are a lot of examples in the example section of how to do it. So we're going to use Rasterio to open the GeoTIFF. Uh, it's a really great library for doing this. Um, and there are lots of examples in the um, examples folder of, of how to kind of import export uh, data. And uh, we'll cover some of that in here. So this is one example of just, hey, let's read in the GeoTIFF. This reads the first band of uh, a GeoTIFF file, which this little context import data, this is just a handy way of being able to find uh, our data, which is in here. But if I run it from another folder, um, I want to make sure I'm always referring to the right place. That's all that is. So this is just uh, a file that is located in here. So it's cmounts.tiff. And this is just a handy way to refer to that file name. OK, let's run it. So if we look at what we have here, uh, we've read in the first band of the GeoTIFF, and we have an array. An array is regularly sampled. So that's really, it doesn't have to be, but um, let me back up a second. An array is a, a collection of, uh, of values in n dimensions. This is two dimensions, but they can be higher dimensional. Uh, this is a NumPy array. Again, if you're not familiar with NumPy, it's just a, a a good Python library for handling array data. But really what makes this an image is the regularly sampled nature of this. Now, from these values alone, we don't necessarily know they're regularly sampled. They're just values, but they are. Image data is all about exploiting the fact that we know it's regularly sampled. It's not XYZ points. It's on a regular grid. And therefore, we can use a lot of much more efficient operations uh, to do calculations on this regular grid. And that's what image processing is all about. So it's all about regularly sampled data. Um, if you don't have regularly sampled data, if you have XYZ points, uh, you would want to interpolate those onto a grid, onto some regular sampling before you apply image processing techniques. So that's really the core of what an image is in the sense that I'm talking about here. Um, Really, a well log is a 1D image. You know, it doesn't have to be two-dimensional. We'll talk mostly about two-dimensional images and three-dimensional images, but a lot of these apply to one-dimensional operations as well. But the key here is regularly sampled, uh, and it makes a lot of the math simpler. It makes a lot of the operations very efficient. So if we look at this, what we see is we have negative values. These are meters. Um, so these are the elevation of the seafloor uh, in meters below sea level. So um, being negative makes sense. Uh, Basically, that's, that's the main thing to know here. So let's actually quickly go ahead and visualize this data. It's great to talk about like, hey, we have numbers, they're integers, um, but let's actually see what it looks like. So we're going to use Matplotlib to do that. Uh, just very quickly show a quick figure. And what we get is the values. Uh, we've got a scale bar here. So I added that with the, uh, the color bar. And what we see is that, again, most things are negative. We do have a few positive values. There's some islands over here and a few scattered out there. But by and large, this is what you'd expect. Uh, this is the Western Pacific. Lots of seamounts out there. That's uh, part of the Marianas Trench. Um, so a lot of interesting stuff going on in this area. But it's fun to think about how would we detect these. So let's say I wanted to you know, look at the density of seamounts in the Western Pacific. I could do it by hand. I could digitize each one of these um, and then you know, run some sort of operation. But this is the sort of thing that should be pretty easy to automate. We have these big obvious spikes, peaks, picking, sticking up above a very uniform background. Uh, so this is a, a pretty common type of image processing task. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing today. And another thing that's inherent to image processing is visualization. Here we've just looked at them in grayscale. Uh, let's make it look pretty. Let's add some color. Uh, so this is just using Matplotlib again. All we're going to do, we're going to basically use a, a color map, which is going to make it shaded in blue. Um, we'll set anything over zero to green, um, and then just show the same thing. So there we go. So we'll talk about color images later. This is still a, a black and white single band image. Uh, we've just thrown color on top of it. So it's not really a color image, but we're just visualizing a, a single band of data with color. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about color in the last section more. But still, it's always useful to be able to visualize your data um, in simple ways. And it's actually quite easy in most of this. So uh, I do want to point out, if we look, we can indeed see some of the islands there. Uh, I just made them flat green. I didn't have tried to apply a color palette to uh, the part above sea level, but uh, they do exist. Um, 
And let's actually start doing some stuff with this now. I can see all these. How do I figure out where they are automatically without drawing you know, polygons around each one of them by hand? So this is a thresholding task. Well, this is one way to do it would be to threshold. So thresholding is one of the simplest forms of segmentation. Thresholding is just saying, let's just take everything that's above some value or below some value and let's classify it based on that. So it's a very, very simple um, part of segmentation. And segmentation in more generally general terms is breaking an image into different regions. So we talk about segmentation, all we mean is trying to identify separate regions, separate features. Um, so let's start out with this. Uh, so thresholding, we're doing a classification here. We're gonna get ones and zeros out of it. And this is a NumPy operation in this case. So we'll just look at anything above 3,500 meters. Now there's a, uh, an actual good reason for that. If you think about oceanic crust, your typical kind of abyssal plane depth works out to about four kilometers um, it, once it's cooled. And so that's basically what we're saying. It's like, hey, let's look at things that are sticking up on average about 500 meters above the uh, typical abyssal plane. And what we see is we get a bunch of Boolean values. Now these are all false in the, the condensed display, but obviously this array is much larger than what we're printing here. Um, it'll be true where we have features that stick up more than 3,500 meters uh, in absolute elevation. So the key thing is it's a Boolean array. It's true and false. Often we'll want to convert that over to numbers. Now in NumPy, um, we can actually do that very efficiently. I won't talk a whole lot about difference between view and as type, uh, but basically, under the hood, these actually are numbers. So we're just going to say, hey, don't worry about the whole true false thing. Just give me ones and zeros really efficiently under the hood. That's what view means here. Um, it, as type is very similar, except it actually makes a copy of the array. So we're just going to be a little more memory efficient. And what we see is, again, the falses have turned into zeros. You don't see any ones, but they would be true for one for true. All right. Talked a lot about that. Just want to mention the difference between Boolean values and numerical values uh, and how to switch back and forth. Let's go ahead and actually look at the results. Not too interesting to talk about, much more interesting to look at. So I'm gonna make a figure uh, with two rows here. I'm gonna put uh, the original bathymetry in one row and our new thresholded thing in the other and just turn off some of the ticks and uh, labels we don't care about. And what we see here is that, uh, well, first off, you may notice there's a little bit of green fringe. If you're looking at the zoomed out view, that's because of the interpolation that's going on. Um, interpolating between one and zero, 0 0.5 has no meaning here, but uh, the way we're displaying it doesn't know that. Regardless though, what we've done, let's zoom in on say that seamount. Okay, we actually have done okay. We just picked a value. We, we you know, said, all right, it, let's get everything that's above this. And we picked out one of the seamounts and the other seamount looks pretty reasonable. Um, but there's also places where we did a really, really bad job. Um, so let's look at over here in the arc and the four arc. Uh, if you believe this, all of this is a seamount. And I, you know, that's not very realistic. We don't want to have the entire uh, volcanic arc and, and four arc being a seamount. We, we really want to, you know, do better about that. The next thing is that we've missed a lot of these small seamounts. So let's let's look at these. These are, you know, quite arguably seamounts. Whether or not we're interested in them, I think, you know, depends on the problem at hand, but it's the sort of thing we would normally want to classify. So while we haven't done terrible, we haven't done great either. Um, it's a decent first pass. It's the simplest possible method. And, you know, this is this is your basic kind of thresholding segmentation. We can do a lot better though. So let's think about ways we could do better. So one of the key issues here is that we're classifying this entire volcanic arc as a seamount. Uh, and really everything goes up here. We get higher in elevation all through here. So if you just think about the, the one of the simplest uh, things we might do, instead of using a constant elevation, uh, we might use an elevation. We're gonna check a threshold above some you know reference, but that reference might be based on where we are. So instead of, doing the same elevation everywhere. We'll change that elevation. We'll use a higher elevation for the four arc uh, in the arc and you know a lower elevation out there in the abyssal plane. Um, so before we get to that, we need to figure out how we can do that. Uh, and that's where some filtering is gonna come into play. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, we're gonna be moving on to the next section. I do wanna pause and mention one thing before we go too much further. And that's that um, I'm gonna be using some, some quick little tricks that I've put into these notebooks. So you could look at the code, but uh, this utils.toggler is just something that's in this repository. All it does is let us quickly toggle back and forth. 
um, you know, for a given layer, and it may take a little bit to display, but that's the idea. We're going to be using this quite a bit. Uh, so just so we don't have to make two plots, we can make one and play around with it. Uh, I just want to mention that because I'm going to come back to it a whole lot as we go on through here. But that's all this tool is, just a handy little visualization thing. OK. Let's go back to our uh, idea of looking at elevation that's not constant. So we want to change the reference elevation that we're thresholding based on, depending on where we are. So we need some way to calculate that. Uh, you could imagine just drawing a bounding box around the, the volcanic arc and going, well, you know, use a different one here. But it would be nice to have something that's a little more, a little less arbitrary, maybe a little more based on the data itself. So one of the things we can do is to filter the data. Filters are the most ubiquitous operation in image processing. Uh, tons of things can be a filter. So all a filter is, is it's a moving window operation. For each pixel in the image, we're going to look at the pixels around it in some window. It could be small, it could be big, it could be square, it could be circular, it could be some strange shape. We're going to take some shape and the value of that pixel is going to be based on some operation of the values in that shape around it, if that makes sense. And we're going to move throughout the image uh, and in each, each pixel apply that same shape or the shape may change. But the idea is, again, we're applying this operation at every pixel based on values of things around it. That's a filter. Uh, there's the most common types are actually based on convolutions. Um, it's just a mathematical term for, uh, you know, again, this idea of using a moving neighborhood. Um, so a convolution has more strict definition. Um, if you're familiar with it, um, I'm saying too much. If you're not familiar with it, just think of it as a stricter definition on, you know, what a filter is. So we're saying something that's very simple, very regular, and can be applied very, very efficiently. Uh, so the simplest one of these is a uniform filter. Uh, oh, the, I, Maybe it's not the simplest, but the simplest one we're going to talk about today is a uniform filter. And a uniform filter is just saying a square region um, that's the same everywhere. And we're just going to take and march through and apply this rectangular square. And the value at each pixel is going to be defined by that square region that's just going to march through. And we're going to treat every pixel in that evenly. So a uniform filter is a, a mean within a square. Very simple idea and very easy to implement. Um, so what we'll do is we'll use scipy.ndimage.uniform filter. There are other ways we could do this, but this is where we're going to start using some of the libraries. Um, I'm not going to show you the underlying code, but rather just this is, you know, you don't want to try to implement this yourself because while it's easy to implement, there are very efficient ways to do it. Uh, and this will take advantage of that. So all we're going to do, take our data. This can be our bathymetry data we looked at earlier. Um, I'm going to define a function here and use one of these other little utilities that uh, are included with this. And this is based on Jupyter widgets. It's nothing terribly fancy. Uh, you can look at the code in the notebook. But uh, we're going to have a slider so we can interactively change it. And so I'm just going to quickly pull this up. It will be a little slow. All right. What we have right now, let me go back over to no, uh, no change. So let's, let's zoom in maybe. OK. <clears throat> What we have right now is the original bathymetry data. Let's try applying a little bit of filtering. OK, what I'm doing here is I'm changing the size of that moving window. So this value is the size of the rectangle. And it's actually a square in this case. It's the same in all dimensions. And it's a value in pixels. So in this case, what I'm doing is a 45 by 45 square around each point. So we'll have 45 by 45 pixels. And I'm taking the mean at that point. Uh, and Notice that you know it's a fair amount of blurring here. If we go way up, it's going to take a second to run, uh, but we'll get much blurrier results. So in this case, we actually start to kind of see the square. But this is 150 pixels, and really we've we've blurred out these C mounts. Uh, and if we look at this, you know, on the large scale, it looks out of focus and blurry. But this is not a bad sort of value for what the you know average elevation of the seafloor in that region is. We're looking at a 150 pixel wide window. And these are, I forget the exact cell size, but this is on the order of, uh, uh, I think this is one kilometer data, actually. So we're looking at a pretty wide region. Um, and you know, 
this is one way of getting that average elevation that we might check for values above uh, the threshold. Okay, so we have some sense that small filters, less blurring, larger filters, more blurring with a uniform filter. Uh, that applies to all kinds of other operators. The bigger you make the window, and we're going to see this in other things, uh, the more you'll simplify the area. So anytime you're looking at something and you're having trouble with getting it picking up on little edges, small features, uh, you usually want to use a larger window. A larger window is slower to compute, but it will pick up the larger scale features. Uh, and there are limits to that. Eventually, you have to start looking at other methods. We'll, we'll get there uh, when we get there. OK, um, really quickly, I do want to mention edges. So I mentioned that 150 pixel wide window. What if we're up here? What happens for these values outside uh, the edge of the, of the image? And that depends on what you ask. Uh, SciPy.indie image has lots of options for handling edge cases. It's one of the nice things about it. Uh, so by default, what it's going to do is reflect. So if we're up here at the edge, it's basically just going to go, OK, pretend this is a mirror. I'm going to get the same values. Um, they're basically going to average nicely because we'll be averaging the values near the edge twice, but that's okay. It still gives us a, an even number of values. It handles it well. We might have decided it made more sense to put in zeros if we're outside the, the boundary. So that 150 pixel wide window and you're in the corner, everything that would be outside the edge of the image, put in a zero, that would be the constant um, mode. So a lot of these are, are pretty handy. Just want to mention that they exist. They'll show up in all of scipy.nd images uh, filter operations. So a lot of these will have them. Uh, mode is how you handle the boundaries. And uh, just look through. The default is reflect, which makes sense in a lot of cases. Uh, but there's all kinds of other options that can make sense as well. Uh, boundary conditions matter. Um, and it's good to think about them. I'm not going to go into them in a ton of detail in this. All right, let's get back to what we're actually doing. I have talked a lot here, but this is a pretty simple concept. Um, so we're just going to take a filter arbitrometry, get the kind of regional average elevation, and then let's look for things that are significantly above that elevation. So here's how we'll do that. We will blur our original bathymetry data. Uh, that's 150 pixels. And then we'll look for anything that is 500 meters above that 150 pixel average. Uh, so that'll give us a little bit cleaner threshold. So we're looking for things that poke up significantly above the average. And let's go ahead and kind of take a look at what this looks like. We'll also compare it to the original threshold. So the simple threshold uh, was just a, you know, we calculated it way back up here. It was just the uh, way back up here. <laughs> that was this. So we're going to show that again. Um, and we'll just compare the differences between the two. I'm also going to turn this off because oh, that's the right one. All right, so here's the bathymetry. This is our original simple threshold, uh, which shouldn't be that long to display. Sorry, this is a little more laggy than I thought it was going to be. Uh, and this is our kind of above the background threshold. Notice the big thing you'll see is that we, you know, before we're hitting the entire arc over here, and now we're doing a pretty good job of only picking out, you know, the arc volcanoes, which are very arguably seamounts. Uh, but let's zoom in and, and take a closer look at some of the uh, smaller features. It's kind of useful to see these. Um, so we go back to our simple threshold. And then now we're picking up a lot of the small seamounts. Uh, you know, so we're doing a much better job in general. Uh, it you know, looks pretty reasonable. Um, one thing I want to point out, though, actually, let me, let me zoom back in. Um, let's find. Uh, I think this, these will work well. If you were doing this, uh, oops, I have to hit the zoom. My apologies. Um, if you were doing this for an actual project, you probably don't really want quite so messy of a region. So first off, this big plateau here, it's, you know, wave, wave cut, um, sort of seam out. What you're seeing is probably an atoll at one point high, but now it's being subducted going down. It's a little lower. Uh, it's getting split up into four different regions. Maybe we want that, maybe we don't. You know, this is a, a higher central peak. Those are higher edges. Um, quite possibly had, you know, reef systems growing, trying to keep up with it being subducted and you get these, you know, actual significant uh, different topography. But we also have little holes within them. So those, those are small holes here. Uh, let me zoom in on this. It's actually a good place to show it. You know, we have a lot of stuff that's not great if we were going to use this data. We don't really want that blip. We want that hole gone. Uh, this, you know, weird little bit sticking down here, that's kind of meaningless. Uh, you know, we'd really like to clean these up a little and get more reasonable boundaries. 
so this is also a filtering operation. So I mentioned filters before. Filters don't have to only apply to continuous data like bathymetry. You can apply filters to regions you've classified. So this sort of one zero, you know, yellow transparent, that's a classification. We can apply a filter to that classification to clean up regions. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, you could make, you know, vector outlines. So we could vectorize each one of those and then run them through, uh, you know, on the vector side, run them through some line simplification algorithm. That's one way. Um, one of the ways I'm going to talk about, though, is image processing based. So we're going to keep these ones and zeros. And one of the common tricks is to apply a median filter uh, to that one and zero classification. So let me actually back up a second. I am getting ahead of myself. Uh, and this is not what we're talking about just yet. But we want to clean these up. <laughs> one of the things we want to do is smooth the boundaries. Uh, the other thing we want to do is remove some of those holes. So I mentioned those little holes we saw earlier. Um, there's a lot of ways we can remove those. So first you have to identify holes, right? How do you define a hole in a region? Well, it turns out there's uh, a key part of image processing is called mathematical morphology. And it deals with these one zero regions. It deals with splitting them out into individual pieces. Uh, it deals with finding holes inside a bigger region. It deals with um, labeling each separate region. It deals with finding out what's connected. And it also deals with things like erosion and dilation. So expanding their shapes, shrinking their shapes, uh, doing things that are like buffering, if, if you're familiar with, um, with vector GIS tools. All that actually comes from geology. I think that gets forgotten a lot, but, but a lot of image processing comes out of geology. Actually, a lot of machine learning comes out of geology. Uh, so this was identified to, uh, originally developed to work on thin sections um, by geologists. Uh, and you know, it's now the cornerstone of tons of image processing. This is the, one of the key low level kind of techniques. Uh, and it's, it comes out of geology, it's very handy. The key thing is it's ways of identifying classified regions. So one zero Boolean regions um, and doing things on those regions. Uh, so mostly it's gonna be, like I said, splitting them into separate regions, finding holes, stuff like that. So with that in mind, I won't go into how it works. It's another filtering operation. We basically have a, a local moving uh, neighborhood and we define holes or not holes and all that based on local connectivity and things within that region. Um, there's a lot that goes into this. It's really cool. If you wanna read some about it on the Wikipedia pages that, that I've linked here, uh, there's some good examples you can find online. We're just gonna use it. We're not gonna worry about exactly how it works, but uh, it's, again, simple operations um, that you can glue together to make more complex tasks. All right, I've said a lot here. Let's go ahead and find our holes. For the libraries we're using, that is a single operation, scipy.indieimage.binary fill holes. It's just gonna take anything that's a hole and fill it in. Uh, very simple sort of thing and incredibly handy. So before we had some holes in our C-mounts, uh, let's look over here. And let's turn on the original really quick. Now, you could very logically argue that that is a real hole that we might be interested in. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Whether or not you apply this is, you know, very much a, um, very much up to you and up to the task. Like sometimes you may want holes, sometimes they're noise, but it's good to know how to fill them in. So if we fill them in, notice we got, first off, we got a big one over here, uh, but these little ones, we also did a good job of filling in. Okay, great. Hey, we filled in all these little holes we don't care about. Maybe we filled in some big stuff we did care about. Uh, this, this doesn't care whether it's a tiny little bitty hole or a great big, like, you know, you got a ring around it and it filled in everything. It will do any hole of any size. Um, if you want to filter based on size, you have to use more complex operations. Uh, the beauty of this is it just, it works for everything that's, that's you know, connected all the way around it on the outside. Um, very handy operation. You'll use it a lot anytime you're doing these sort of classification tasks. All right. I mentioned before we want to clean up the boundaries, though. We filled the holes in. How do we get the boundaries a little more smooth? This comes back to filtering as well. So this is the median filter. Uh, there's a few different ways to handle this, but the idea is that we don't want to smooth the values, right? If we applied our uniform filter that we, we talked about before, if we applied that, it would average, and we wouldn't get ones and zeros. We would get 0 0.3, 0 0.5, um, and we could threshold that, and that's one way to do it. You could you know, smooth it and then threshold at 0 0.5. That does work, but there's another operation that only gives you values that were originally in the image, and that's uh, a median filter um, is one thing 
you can think about. The nice thing about a median filter is that it takes the median, right? So it ranks all the values and this will be within a, a neighborhood around that pixel. It will rank all the values uh, from smallest to largest and then get you know the one in the middle. That means you never average. You always get a value that actually existed in the raster. And if we're dealing with a one zero, you know, simple binary classification, only one class essentially, we have that class and then not that class. Uh, a majority filter, I'm uh, sorry, a median filter is a great way to clean that up. What it tells you is we look at everything in a window and if most of the pixels around it, around that area are one class, then we make the pixel in the center that class. And it does a great job of, of cleaning up these little spurious edges and, and you know removing tiny little blobs. So it will also do things like if there's a tiny you know one pixel seamount we really didn't care about. It'll just remove it because when we go over this with this median filter, it's going to look at a you know n by n pixel around it uh, window. And when we take the median, that one value is not you know going to be the median. The median is going to be zero. So we'll remove those out. Uh, it's really good for cleaning up classifications. One thing I do want to mention is that it only works if you have, you know, one zero binary classifications. Let's say you had a land cover classification map um, and you had like, you know, forest, grassland, urban, water, uh, four or five classes. In that case, you can do the same idea, except that we're no longer just taking the median. Instead, we're going to look at what's the majority. So um, if we have five classes, we go through, we take that and we'd say, okay, well, you know, 40% of these are corn, but you know, 20% are forest and 20% are urban and 20% are water. So we're going to call this corn because more of the pixels in the neighborhood are corn than anything else, if that makes sense. That's a majority filter. Uh, it's just the equivalent for more complex classifications. And um, thankfully, uh, Scikit image does indeed give us uh, a simple operation for it. Uh, so I just want to mention that because it's the same idea, but anytime you're doing um, processing on multiple classes, you'll have the same thing with majority instead of median. Okay, I've talked a whole heck of a lot. One thing I do want to mention is that all of these, majority filter, median filter, anything that involves ranking and sorting everything within a moving window is quite slow. Uh, so you're going to notice this is going to take a bit to run, uh, particularly when we get to larger sizes. So I'm pre-computing things rather than doing a slider. Uh, so I'm going to do widths of three by three pixels, five by five pixels, 11 by 11, and 21 by 21. 21 by 21 really takes quite a while to run. The reason is for every pixel in the image, it's going to take, what's 21 squared, 400 and something, um, a fairly large number of pixels. It has to sort them, which is a fairly slow operation, and then get the one in the center uh, at the 50th percentile. And that's not fast. Uh, that's actually what it's doing for this. There's no way around really simplifying it if you're doing a true median filter. It's a slow operation. So big windows with these get very slow very quickly. Small windows are very quick. So another thing to keep in mind is it can be very handy to run a big window median filter, but it can be very computationally expensive. And I've said all that. Let's actually take a look at what it is. OK, so we got off is our bathymetry. Um, zero by zero is our uh, original classification. This really should not be taking so long to update. And let's zoom in here on our area we were looking at before. All right, we filled the holes. Remember, that was the, the step we did before. So we no longer have holes. Um, if we run a three by three median, it cleans it up a little. Notice we got a little, a little cleanup. Uh, five by five does a little more. Let's go back to the original just really quickly. So you can see the original and five by five smoothed it a bit. 11 by 11, we've really started to do a pretty good job. So let's go back to the original and 11 by 11. And then let's do uh, the original and 21 by 21. You know, we've really started to smooth things here with this 21 by 21. So we've taken off all these little spurs on the edges. Um, we've, we've removed like that bit. We've actually entirely removed some of our C mounts that we classified before. So that, that little one and that little one, those are gone. Um, you know, it, it's a matter of how much simplification do you want? but it's a very effective way of simplifying these things. And it's another type of, of filtering. Uh, so yeah, just want to mention it. It's handy, a uh, very common task for cleaning up regions. All right, so to summarize what we did, um, let's choose something in between. That 21 by 21 was really pretty, pretty heavy on the simplification. Uh, the 11 by 11 was much more in between as a little more, you know, maybe a little light. So we'll, we'll do 13 by 13 just to uh, give us something reasonable. So. One other thing I want to mention is 
I should have found an example of this. When we run the median filter, actually, let me go ahead and run this. Uh, you know what? I wonder. Let me. Okay. So we'd already rerun it, so I didn't want to waste time waiting on it. But I do want to find an example of where we can introduce new holes. So let's look over. You know, let's just look over in here. And I will find some in a second. It simplifies it. It can actually cause new holes to form. So before we might've had something that was not actually connected such that it made a, a hole, but after we run the median filter, it is. Uh, so let me see if I can find it maybe over here. I'm sure there's some somewhere. Um, well, all right, I will skip the, the great hunt for uh, places where this happened. But one of the things you should always know with a median filter uh, or other similar cleanup filters, we removed holes once at the beginning, we run it, we actually have to remove holes a second time after running it because the filter can cause new holes to form. That's just one of the things that, that comes out of it. So quite often the approach you'll wanna use when you're cleaning up these regions is remove holes, filter, then remove holes again. Uh, and that's what we'll do here. We, we removed holes once earlier. Um, we then apply the median filter and then we remove the holes again a second time to make sure we got all of them out. All right, can let this run for a second. The next thing we're gonna move on to, we've segmented the array. So we, we've done some sort of classification. We've gotten, okay, we think this is a C-mount. We think it's not a C-mount. We've, we've done it in a way that's a little more complex than we initially did. And you know, it's not perfect, but it's, it's reasonable. Um, we need to actually take and identify individual C-mounts. We wanna know something about C-mount density, right? So we wanna count these. We wanna know, hey, there are 400 of these I've, I've identified. How do we take this region up here that's, you know, these individual one zero. So all these are ones, all these yellows are ones. How do we find how many individual regions there are? How do we count, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. How do we do that? That's one of the other things of mathematical morphology. Um, so what it can do is it can segment regions. So we've got the classification. We're gonna move on to where we actually say, this is one connected region. This is another connected region. And so it looks for connectivity. It's gonna take uh, adjacent pixels and you can define whether or not something's connected in different ways. I won't go into that, but you can imagine looking at you know, the pixels directly above and to the sides, uh, or you could also look at the diagonals or maybe you could consider even, well, it's connected. Even if there's a one pixel gap, we're still gonna consider it connected. Um, there are ways to do all that. The key there is it's some sort of structuring element. Again, the same idea of a moving window, it is a filter. Um, so we define this structuring element. The simplest one is just all if we have one pixel, it's all of the eight pixels immediately adjacent to it. That's a simple one. You can imagine more complex ones. Um, and we just see, are they connected? Uh, that is what we actually do when we go through and label things. So sapa.indieimage.label does this. Uh, and what it'll do is it will take every region where the pixels are connected to each other and you know separate from another region and give that a unique value. So let's uh, take a look at what this does. Okay, what I've done here, we've got our, our classification we ran, we cleaned up, we got rid of the little bitty things and we've actually got a count. So this is where it starts to get kind of cool. Before this is like, okay, yeah, sure, great. We're, we're filtering, we're thresholding, fine. Now we've actually got something useful for analysis. Um, we actually have a count. So all this has done is use scipod.indieimage.label that turns that classified region into everything that's connected here has the same value. And they're colored by value, but the colors can be a little hard to see. Everything over here actually has a different value. We've introduced uh, values for connected regions into this array. Uh, and that gives us a very easy way of going through and getting um, how many there are. In fact, that's one of the things it returns. One is this array with uh, values in there and the other is the total count. Um, so, hey, this is handy. This is the sort of thing that pops up a lot. Um, you know. We can talk about doing like grain size analysis with this. It's the same idea. Uh, you can imagine instead of just counting, you might want to know what's the, the size of these. Uh, in fact, we'll look at that here. So now that we have each individual region, we can start looking at properties of that region. 
So let's go ahead and do some of that. Um, we've got a value. This is this, this labels. What we have is each one of these has a uh, unique value. So, you know, this is 316. Uh, that one is 223. Notice what I'm hovering here. That one is 125. That one is 118. You get the idea. Um, and in zero, wherever there's not a seamount, but zero is displayed as no data right now. Okay. Let's say we wanted to go through and look at the areas of these seamounts. Um, I should have said this at the beginning, but let's say we want to do, we want to analyze the density of the seamounts, I think is what I said, but let's say we wanted to analyze their area distribution. We want to say something about, you know, volcanic processes forming these. Um, are we seeing things where it's a few really large connected seamounts or a lot of isolated ones? Uh, you know, th there might be some sort of interesting analysis you might want to do here. So let's say we want to look at a histogram of the area of each of these seamounts. Now I'm going to digress for a bit is that we can do that very quickly. Let's go ahead and just get this very simple uh, area in pixels. So all we have to do, there's a sum function. Uh, so how many of, well, I won't ask because it's, <laughs> you can't really respond, but uh, many of you may be familiar with zonal statistics in ArcGIS. So zonal statistics basically gives you statistics about each region. And usually it's a vector and then you're working on a raster or, or it's a classified raster and you're working on another raster. Uh, the exact same thing is built into sci-fi.md image. Uh, and it has a few common things uh, to do that with. So one of the simplest ones is sum. This will take our labels and just sum some value. In this case, we'll sum ones because it's the classified thing and we'll get a count of pixels. So if we just wanna know, hey, for each one of these seamounts we've identified, how many pixels is it? It's very simple. It's one function call. Um, we'll get a dictionary as a result, uh, and we can just go through and essentially, well, actually, we'll get a, an array as a result, sorry. Uh, but we'll run sapod.indiimage.sum. We'll pass in our ones and zeros array. So this is going to sum up ones where the seamounts are. Uh, our labels identifies which seamounts, you know, which pixels are connected to each other. Uh, and then we'll give it um, a number we're going to run it on. So this is just, hey, what values do you care about? In this case, we're going to say all of them. Um, but uh, you could imagine running this on just, you know, features X, Y, and Z. Uh, we'll run it, we'll get this, and we'll get a very quick histogram of area. So this is area in pixels. All right. Um, if you're actually doing analysis, as I'm sure everyone's aware, uh, pixels are not a very useful unit of measure. Uh, this actually is geolocated data. We, we know where this is. We know how big it is. So let's actually convert area and pixels to something meaningful. Now, one thing to point out here is that area is actually pretty hard to get at. Uh, if you're familiar with, with map projections, what a lot of projections do is try to make it so that you can use the map coordinates to directly get area. If we just take Cartesian area, we'll get something reasonable. The problem is any projection that does that cannot fundamentally represent a large area accurately. So you have to choose between being able to work with a large area or getting accurate area calculations. Um, and it's fundamental, uh, you can't get around that. So quite often for data storage, you want something that can represent a large area. So you'll use a rectangular projection for data storage uh, for a lot of good reasons. But then when you're actually doing analysis on it, you need to go back to something that represents area and it's not a simple Cartesian calculation. So. This is true for geographic uh, WS84 lat long. Um, it's true for Web Mercator. It's true for a lot of things. It's true for every projection to some degree. If we're working in lat long, so geographic uh, coordinates, the formulas are pretty simple. We can actually get uh, a pretty accurate area. This will not be absolutely precise, but we can assume the Earth is a sphere, which for our purposes, this is really close enough, um, and then get a very simple conversion. So we have latitude and longitude. We know that the width of a degree of uh, latitude remains the same, but then the, uh, the height of a degree of latitude rather, but uh, the width of a degree of longitude changes with latitude. So as we move towards the poles, longitude gets smaller and smaller. Uh, and then at the equator, um, the easy number to remember is 111. So if you can just remember 111 uh, kilometers uh, to one degree at the equator, um, it's 111 point two, eight, some odd, whatever, 111.3 uh, is more than precise enough for our estimates here. All we have to do is take, and it varies by the cosine of latitude. So we'll just multiply by the cosine of latitude to get the width of degree of, um, of longitude. And then we can get an area of each pixel. 
I've said a lot here. This is simpler than it sounds. All we're going to do is we're going to calculate a new array. And that new array will be the area of each one of those pixels. It's not going to be the same everywhere. The reason we need that is that we need to convert our pixel units back into area. So each pixel has a different area. That means we need to sum differently. We need to sum up their, their area, not just a value of one. But we can use the same function. So I'm going to use some tricks here with NumPy um, and a little bit with Rasterio. So all this is, mgrid here is just making a regular array of i and j. This is you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, repeating in different directions, um, just so we have something to start with. We can convert those to latitudes and longitudes in a second. So to convert them to latitudes and longitudes, we're actually going to let Rasterio do the work for us. It knows where this is located. It knows how to make that transformation. This data is in latitude, longitude. Um, WGS84 is the datum. So we're going to let it handle that. All we have to do is essentially say, call the xy function of that geotiff object that we've opened uh, with our i and j row and column uh, coordinates, and we'll get out longitudes and latitudes. We also just, you know, for simplicity here, I'm going to grab the cell size directly from the uh, from some of the metadata from the geotiff. Technically, there's some caveats around this. The source.transform.a is only the cell size if it's square cell cells on a north south simple rectangle grid, which this is. Um, but I don't want to get too far down the details of that. If you're familiar with raster data, uh, you'll immediately recognize this is a, an affine transform, and it's one element of an affine transform, and it's good enough for now. If if all this sounds like Greek to you, just don't worry about the details. All we're saying is how big is the cell in degrees? And then we have the exact latitude and longitude of those cells. So we could actually work out exactly which one big it is uh, if we wanted to, but easy enough to get here. Okay, I've explained this a bit too much. Let's go into the area calculation quickly. Um, our cell size, which again is gonna be in degrees, times the width of a degree of latitude or the width of degree of longitude at the equator uh, squared. So again, we're basically taking our, this is just our, our cell size in degrees with a simple conversion to kilometers uh, and turning into area. And then we'll multiply by the cosine of the latitude. So that's gonna scale it such that, you know, you're getting the correct area as we move away from the equator. Um, so this is gonna give us the area of each pixel in that grid. And now we can do that same sum function so we have our scipy.indianimage.sum we used before. Last time we put in ones and zeros. This time we're going to put in floats. They're actually going to be some area in actual uh, square kilometers. And we're going to sum those. So same idea. We're going to take each seamount, sum it up, sum up the area of each pixel, uh, and then we'll get the total area of the seamount out of that. And let's go ahead and look at that. While that runs, I'm going to take a drink of water. Okay, now we actually have something here. We've gone from having this bathymetry map to going through, finding seamounts on it. And finally, we actually have you know, an example of a histogram of the areas of the seamounts. We can look at the distribution of areas. And you may notice that it's uh, a log normal-like distribution. I do want to point that out. Um, you can infer some stuff about processes uh, from distribution sometimes. I and mean, I'm sure a lot of you may be familiar with brain size distributions, obviously. Um, in this case, all it really means is we have taken two things, uh, width and a height, and multiplied them. When you multiply normal distributions together, the more normal distributions you multiply together, the more you start to approximate a log normal uh, distribution. Uh, well, actually, you do it as soon as you get two, essentially. But uh, you'll see this all the time anytime you work with area in natural processes. If you work with areas or volumes, uh, you tend to get a log normal like distribution out. And you'll see this exactly here. We're looking at areas, and we have something that has this big spike near zero and this long tail that goes out to very large areas, um, you know, in, in some cases. Uh, so it actually shows up all the time in natural processes. And it's largely because you're essentially multiplying things. Uh, that's the essential arm wavy uh, explanation. There's, there's more to it than that. But um, anytime you start looking at things that multiply different variables, you start to see log normal. I'm over explaining yet again. All right, hopefully this makes sense. Um, kind of a fun little simple example, but hopefully it gives you an overview of segmentation, filtering, thresholding. Um, well, 
filtering being or thresholding being the simplest form of segmentation, uh, but how do we actually break those out? So that's sort of part of segmentation. And how do we use filters uh, to do different operations on the images? We'll keep on coming back to these same ideas. Uh, this was a, a hopefully a fairly conceptually simpler uh, sort of technique. It's, you know, we're not doing anything too crazy, but we still get a lot of useful information out of it. And we'll build on all of these operations later. I'm going to say one thing though, that's that anytime you're actually doing this, you want to get the data back out of this. You want to get it into ARC or QGIS. You want to work with it somewhere else. So let's say that we did want to go ahead and load that data elsewhere. I'm not going to take the time in this tutorial to explain how to do that, but I do want to show you uh, how we might take these outlines that we've we've automatically classified and save them as a shapefile uh, so we can pull them in elsewhere. And so I won't go through this example in a ton of detail, but it's there if you'd like to, to look at it. So just to point out, um, if you go back up to uh, the repository and you look at the examples, um, you know, all these are here. This one is... Uh, this one is seamount detection saving. So, you know, it's it's right here. If you want to pull it up, uh, you can look at it in detail. Um, but, you know, this, this shows you something you can build on. So the basic idea, we're going to, you know, copy out our, our new classified raster uh, using our settings from the previous one. Uh, we're going to actually make a shape file, define the fields, uh, and then write out all of these features uh, into it. So there's a lot of kind of you know, understanding the libraries and knowing how to do this in this example. Uh, but if you ever just want something, a quick example of like, hey, how do I save a GeoTIFF? How do I take something in that GeoTIFF and vectorize it and write it out to a shapefile? Uh, here's a quick example of doing that. Um, and, you know, hopefully you find it useful. All right. So one of the things I'm going to do here is uh, just mention some ideas you might think about. It doesn't have to be done in the time, the second half of this tutorial, when we're going to be looking at, you know, more um, playing with your own data, but if you want to do it, then you could. I've also got some other uh, examples we'll, we'll get to at the very end uh, that you might think about. But, you know, this is just, uh, a, if you want to learn on your own, some, some thoughts. Uh, so you might think about excluding things that actually touch the surface. So we did all this. How do I exclude things that actually breach the surface. It's not a seamount if it's an island, arguably. So you might think about how to filter on things that have an actual elevation that's greater than zero in these classification regions we've done. Um, there's a lot of like fancy ways you could do this. There's a lot of simple ways you could do this. Um, I'll leave it up to y'all to think about how you might want to uh, approach it. I've got a few hints in here. Uh, if that seems way too obvious, you know, look at through mathematical morphology and play around with some of the things we didn't talk about. Um, a good example of this might be, we have all these seamounts that are almost touching. What if we wanted to combine any seamount that was within, say, you know, 20 pixels of another seamount? How would we do that with some of the mathematical morphology operations? Um, there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, and, you know, again, just think about it, try to play with it. These are, these are fun exercises to get you more familiar with the sort of operations uh, that are done. And uh, there are examples to both of those uh, in the examples folder, um, but there's a lot of ways to do this. Okay, so let me just quickly summarize what we did uh, just for everyone to kind of remember. We read the bathymetry in, we thresholded it on a constant elevation, which didn't really work very well. We uh, estimated the background elevations with a, a uniform filter. So we applied some filtering um, and then basically said, let's call a seamount anything that's 500 meters above that background, which worked pretty well. Um, we cleaned them up with a median filter and with removing holes. Uh, and then we counted how many actual connected uh, regions of these pixels there were to give us a count of seamounts. And then we looked at the area of those seamounts to get a histogram. We'll do similar techniques with these other sections. We'll just kind of build on a lot of this in different ways. Um, all right, so I'm gonna take about a five minute break. I will try to answer questions. Uh, it's also a chance for me to drink some water and not talk for a bit, but uh, uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, and we'll give us a few minutes to kind of ask them and, and uh, I can try to respond to them as best I can. Some of them may have to wait until later, but I will try to respond to, uh, to things uh, eventually, I promise. And I'll try to do it uh, for quick questions. I'll try to do it now. One thing to notice, if you wanna go ahead and pull up the next section um, is that it's linked here. We're gonna talk about gradients and edge detection, uh, but you can go ahead and start looking at it if you'd like. And there's a link right there. All right, uh, I'm gonna mute myself for a bit, uh, get some more water and try to answer some of y'all's questions. So let's, Plan on starting back, let's say in, in seven minutes, that'll put it at uh, uh, 15 past the hour. 
um, in all of the various time zones that we're in. I know uh, some of y'all are in uh, time zones where it's rather late. So I, I do appreciate y'all coming, uh, especially, um, you know, for folks uh, where this is uh, 9 or 10 p.m. So uh, thank y'all a bunch and I'll see you soon. And while, uh, while Joe is taking some water, um, I'm actually also going to do that as well. But I would like you to, everybody who participate, if you could please just drop a line in the chat, uh, letting us know uh, where you guys are, uh, are sitting. Uh, we can use that uh, for some uh, statistics later. All right, see you in a bit.
Okay. I think we have everyone back. Um, let me, there we go. Also had to uh, <laughs> put my uh, a standing desk down there. Um, gets a little old to sit up the entire time. Although I'm gonna try to switch back and forth a little bit to uh, prevent my back from completely giving out. So um, we're gonna go ahead and, and move on to the next section. Uh, so uh, hopefully everyone's uh, able to find it and uh, able to, to go on to it. Um, the, the goals of the next section, um, so also, I just want to say, uh, before we actually get too far, uh, it's really great to see everyone from, from really all around the world. I'm, I'm very impressed by, uh, by how many people there are from how many different places. And, and thank you all a ton for, for joining. I hope it's useful. Um, and really, thanks to the Nordic Center Mary Research Group again um, uh, for, for you all hosting this. I think it's a, a wonderful uh, thing to do. And um, um, uh, <laughs> I'm always impressed when people are, are uh, joining from places where it's, it's quite late. Oh, time. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you all for tolerating me doing this uh, morning uh, North American time. Just because, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, time zones are always difficult. I, I work with people uh, all over the world and I, I often feel bad that uh, everyone else gets forced into U.S. time zones. Um, but at any rate, uh, thank you for letting me run this. It, it's something that wasn't too awful my time. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk about uh, gradients and edges and lineaments. Uh, so we'll kind of get into uh, some fun stuff as we go on through this. Uh, but to get to that, we, we really need to talk about some of the, the simpler things that underlie it. Uh, so gradients are one of the things that shows up in you know pretty much everything. Everyone's pretty familiar with, with a gradient in general. Um, and I'll, in this case, when we're talking about topographic data, that really means slope. So it's a very simple, intuitive thing to think about. Uh, but we can apply that same concept to any image data. Uh, you know, we'll work with topographic data here. But I just want to point out that the same idea of rate of change uh, is very useful for photographs or you know, uh, well logs, obviously, to some degree. Um, it, it, we'll talk about some of the fundamental trade-offs there, and we'll actually apply this eventually uh, to other types of data and, and really kind of use it to get interesting details back out. So we're going to go into kind of a deep dive into uh, gradients and slopes, and we'll talk a little bit about how they can be useful. Um, OK, so. We're going to start looking at things that aren't just raw values, really. That's the key here. Before, we were looking at C-mounts where they were using the absolute value. Um, now we're going to look at things that aren't the absolute value. We're going to look at things that are derivatives, um, other sort of features, uh, to try to pick out other interesting things uh, about the C-mounts. Um, we'll still use C-mounts in this section. We're going to get to toe of slope eventually, which is one of the things you can start thinking about. Um, and you know, it's. Uh, it's an interesting exercise for uh, topographic data, but the exact same sorts of things will apply when we get to uh, aerial photographs. All right, so I just want to mention, um, once again, this is uh, some setup. So let's go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about uh, our bathymetry, and then let's look at a local gradient. Uh, so what we're going to have here is a rate of change uh, and a rate of change in each direction uh, on our bathymetry. Bathymetry is an easy thing to think about that, right? We're thinking about local slope. So let's load it in. We'll calculate a simple gradient. We'll get uh, a rate of change in the y direction and a rate of change in the x direction. Uh, and then we'll just display those with a color bar. <clears throat> and I'm also going to go ahead and, uh, well, close that one because we have a lot of these. Uh, yeah. Make sure I don't have too much random stuff running. All right, sorry about that. Back to this. OK, so what we've done, we've calculated the gradient. Uh, we look at the raw data, and then we see a rate of change. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this, just so everyone can, can see what's going on. Um, OK, this is a much slower than I would have guessed it is. I think uh, my laptop may be doing a bit too much with Zoom. but. That's OK. What we can see here, we have the C-mounts, our original bathymetry. And now we have our dy. So this is rate of change in the x direction, and what we can see, sorry, the y direction. Um, due to the way the image is defined, we actually are flipping kind of y. So we're going from top towards the bottom. And you'll notice as we go across the C-mount, we'll see it increase. So that's positive, And then decrease. 
I know scale bar over here, uh, going back down the other side. So this is kind of top to bottom. Uh, for the DX, we're going left to right. Uh, so we'll see again this increase and then decrease we go across. That's gradient, nice and simple, easy to understand. Um, but we're going to come back to that in a lot of ways. Uh, so just keep this in mind. This is the simplest possible case. We're going to do a lot more with this. All right, let's start out with one other thing we might think about. Uh, that's the, the rate of change. We looked at the change in the x direction, the change in the y direction. We get these, you know, funny doubled up patterns. Um, it, really what we want to look at is something more like, hey, how, how steep is it there? So we might start thinking about gradient magnitude. Gradient magnitude is very close to slope. So gradient magnitude is what is the total rate of change? Um, and slope would be just putting that in an angle. So same number, different units. Uh, and it's non-linear change, but, but we won't worry about that too much right now. So let's go ahead and let's look at the gradient magnitude. This is just the hypotenuse, so the square root of the sum of the squares uh, for these dx and dy numbers. Um, and there's a built-in function in, in NumPy to do that, but we could also have written, um, you know, something like, uh, yeah. I can't type today, my apologies. So you could also write something like that. That's all we're doing. Okay. So what we've got right now is this gradient magnitude. I've put dark values uh, to be high numbers. So these are places where the slope is changing very rapidly and uh, white values to be places that are kind of background. So basically the, the abyssal plane where it's nice and flat. Um, and this immediately looks a lot like a hill shape plot, right? So you look at this and, and you start picking out features by eye. Um, it's a really great way of showing where things are changing. I mean, this is, you get a lot of information here about um, what's going on, about the, kind of the, the higher level features. So if we look at one of these seamounts, you know, and we're, we're doing visual interpretation, um, looking at this view is actually pretty difficult because while we see the, the, the overall values, we see these things rising up over, you know, deeper values. It's a great way to tell relative absolute changes. It's a very bad way of getting these fine levels of detail. Um, so if we're looking at something about morphology, we really want to use some of these uh, filters, some of these gradient approaches to highlight small changes. And I'm sure everyone's very familiar with hillshade plots. Uh, we're going to get to that in just a second. So hillshade is a little bit different than this. Um, this is gradient magnitude. Notice we don't have a direction to it. It's, it's just like every side is the same. Um, so it's not always the best display to put over an image. Um, we'll show some others that, that are sometimes a little better for the eye, but it's a good one to keep in your back pocket because sometimes it is very useful to look at. Uh, but it really lets you see some of these fine features. And it also, if we wanted to identify uh, the steepest slopes in the image, which might be useful for um, some sort of classification when we're looking at, uh, let's just say, recent failures, recent slope failures. We'd look for very steep slopes. You can imagine using this gradient magnitude pretty directly. Um, but let's go ahead and do that translation to put gradient magnitude into actual slope in degrees. Uh, so to do that, we actually need to know something about the cell size. Um, we're not going to worry about the fact that this is varying north to south like we did before when we're trying to calculate area. It'll be a little off. That's OK. Uh, so we're going to grab our cell size. Uh, we're going to ignore the fact that this is in lat long and actually changes with location. But let's just do a very simple um, slope calculation. We've got the gradient magnitude. Well, I've got the gradient, rather. Remember that dx and dy. Uh, we're going to put in our actual known cell size. So we're going to approximate this being in meters with that same 111.3 uh, at the equator. This is translating it into meters and not kilometers. And then our cell size of the actual raster. Uh, so all that makes sense. Gradient, NumPy gradient, actually does take another option for how big, what's the spacing of these arrays. Um, and we're just going to feed that in. And that means we'll get dx uh, and dy in actual real world units. We'll get it in meters. Uh, and then we can get the slope, which is just the arc tangent, um, essentially, of of our gradient magnitude. Uh, so gradient magnitude and slope are related just through the, uh, through the arc tangent. And we'll put that back in degrees. OK, said a lot here, but let's go ahead and look at it. Um, what you'll notice eventually, there we go. We've got gradient magnitude, we've got slope. Um, 
you know, gradient magnitude is a great thing to look at just for quick uh, analysis. But, you know, if we actually want to put this in numerical units, uh, you know, it's much easier to actually think about uh, degrees than it is, you know, what's the value of, of 200. <laughs> Turns out that's about 30 degrees, but you need to know a lot of information to get there. So I just want to kind of mention how that's done. Um, this only really applies to things like elevation data that have real world units. If we're actually doing um, an image, um, the, you know, the calculations potentially different, but the information is the same. We may not care about slope and degrees, but we do care about the rate of change. Okay, so one of the things we'll do here is um, we've got the gradient magnitude. We displayed it with this reverse color map, such as high values of black. It looks a lot like a hillshade image. Let's go ahead and actually calculate hillshade. It's just because I want to I want to show some of these uh, image processing tricks that are very useful for visual analysis. We use hillshade all the time in geology for visual interpretation. But we often don't back up and think about how to calculate it. If we're talking about gradients, hillshade's actually pretty simple. So um, I'm going to compare them. Let's not worry exactly about the hillshade calculation. Uh, for those who, who may not be familiar with it, the basic idea is that you have an illumination direction. So we have the sun coming from some direction, and then we have topography at different angles. And what we're showing is basically how much, you know, it's, it's like lighting it up, how much reflection will we get off of those surfaces. And a very simple way of doing that is to use something like this. Um, I don't want to go into the trick, but the basic idea is that we're looking at the, you know, the instant angle versus the slope angle and finding out how, you know, how orthogonal they are. This doesn't take into account shadows or any other things you might do in more advanced hill shading. This is just a very simple, very straightforward bit of trig. They'll give us actually a hill shade. And let's look at it. And once again, this is a little slower to run than I was thinking it would be. I probably have some stuff running in the background that's slowing this down. Should be pretty snappy. All right, let's zoom in on, on some of our C-mounts here. Let's show our gradient magnitude. Um, and then let's show the hill shade. OK, they look really different. You know, if, if you're visually interpreting something, you're sitting here probably thinking like, oh, man, why would I want to look at the hill shade? That looks awful. Um, it's most useful when it's combined with other things. So you know, this looks nicer, much nicer as a black and white plot. Uh, hill shade, it, you know, it may not look very good right now, but when we start applying other techniques with it, uh, it can really make things pop. So let's talk for a second about why that is. Um, gradient magnitude is really focusing on these small changes. Hillshade actually removes some of those. Um, it, it shows us more information about the, the direction of the slope. Um, so it makes it harder to see you know, these, these small fine changes, but it also lets us really emphasize some of the smaller ones. So we can combine it with the actual raw bathymetry data uh, which is very good at showing, you know, some of the, the, the large wavelength kind of absolute values. And we get a nice uh, example, which I'm sure all of you have seen things like this, uh, but we'll go ahead and, and do it. I just want to point out this is actually built into Matplotlib. Um, so it's a little clunky to use. I uh, always meant to add a better function for this, but um, um, a few years back, I added some, some better uh, blending mode specifically for topography because uh, what was there before is not very good for, for this use case. But so there's some built-in stuff now that actually is very similar to what you get if you were to do this in ArcGIS or, or other things. Um, and you can do it just with Matplotlib. Uh, so let me zoom back up. Well, we'll leave them open. This is the hill shaded bathymetry and it looks very nice. It's actually really not too much code. It's a little bit clunky um, and, you know, it, but we get a nice result. And so I just want to mention that you can do this just with these tools. You're very used to seeing these displays in pretty much any professional software. They do exist in, in the open side too. Um, it's just that you have to think about the building blocks. And I want to mention this partly because it relates back to gradients. Remember, we calculated this from the gradient. So for image processing, we'll quite often calculate gradients and do something with them. And Hillshade's a very good example of that. It's something that you're, you're used to seeing. You know, you're really used to kind of interpreting things that, that have Hillshading applied. Um, but it's good to think about it as, you know, we got the gradients, we calculated the angle of those gradients relative to some light source, uh, and we got a result out. You can do similar sort of operations uh, on any images. It doesn't just have to be bathymetry. Uh, it can be very useful. Uh, so this is a nice little visualization exercise, but it's also a good example of using uh, gradient information uh, to do uh, to do other things. Okay, so uh, kind of neat example there, but let's actually do something with it. Uh, it's great to visualize. You know, this looks snazzy, <laughs> but let's go back to our gradient magnitude. 
one of the things we might want to do is use that to actually look at kind of edge detection. So finding the edges of these seamounts. So if we look at a seamount, um, the edges of the seamounts are high gradient magnitude. So they're, they're outlined in kind of black here. Um, and we can do things like that. In general, this is edge detection. So with bathymetry, it's pretty, you know, useful to think about it as like, hey, we're going to find steep slopes. The same thing applies to uh, a photograph or, you know, a seismic, uh, actual seismic data or um, even a thin section. What we're looking at is places where there's consistently a high rate of change. Uh, and we find those because those are edges. So we want to like get a, a line, uh, an individual kind of discrete boundary that we think represents uh, different units. And that's uh, a very common uh, technique in image processing. There's a ton of different operators. Um, the simplest one we're going to look at is going to be a Sobel filter. Uh, so this is another type of filter. We're going to look at a neighborhood that's going to be uh, two separate neighborhoods, but they're going to be straight kind of X, Y with a, a very simple, um, small thing. I won't exactly explain too much of exactly what it is. You can look it up. It's just, it's, you know, a very small filter with just a few numbers in it. The idea being, it's very similar to a gradient, uh, but it tries to correct for some of the um, little inherent things that a gradient looks specifically in a, a single direction. A Sobel filter tries to be a little more uniform to, to round out things just to account for pixelation. So that's quite often why you'll see it used um, in image processing. It's, it, it is a gradient. A Sobel filter gives you a gradient, but it gives you a gradient that's uh, a little more friendly for a lot of uh, photograph type images. The difference is the values are significantly different. All right, Sobel filter is the most common edge detector. You'll hear it a lot. Uh, it's gonna be a factor of eight different from the actual gradient if you were to calculate the gradient mathematically. So let's compare these. Um, we'll go ahead and get our gradient magnitude. We're gonna do uh, a little different, exactly the same thing we did, but basically um, look at this compared to a Sobel filter. And give it a second here. Oh, fun. Okay, well, remember how I said um, that I was having trouble with, yeah, let's, let's, uh... hold on, let me, uh... apparently I had too many things running. <laughs> so I'm gonna restart this. My apologies for this, folks. Uh, what I will do while this is getting kind of going again here, um, we we'll need to load in our data and whatnot. Uh, so one of the things that we're doing here is we're looking at the Sobel filter. We're going through, we're going to compare it to the values we got from a gradient. Um, and I think all these are already done. Yeah, uh, it's the downside with, with having a Zoom running while you're uh, actually trying to run things interactively. Quite often kind of, wind up pressing memory a little bit too much. Okay, so back to this one. Hopefully we won't kill things this time. All right, <clears throat> sorry I'm rambling on so much here. So what we've got here is the gradient and the Sobel filter um, shown left and right, and then a gradient magnitude down in the center. So, yeah, this is way slower than what I thought. Notice the Sobel filter, there was a, a factor of eight difference. Um, that I have actually uh, corrected for, but we're still going to see a little bit difference in values uh, between the two. But anyway, the, the gradient, notice they look almost identical. If you really zoom in here and look close, you will notice that you get very slightly different values with the Sobel filter. Um, it's just a little more smooth than average. This is really down in the noise. The only reason I'm mentioning it is that you'll quite often hear a Sobel filter used all the time. And I just want to point out, it is exactly the same as a gradient calculation, it's just different units. So it's a factor of eight off and uh, I've corrected for that. And then it's a little more smooth. I have over explained this quite a bit, but hopefully that makes sense. We're gonna use the Nobel filter because that's the thing you'll hear all the time in image processing uh, tutorials and the like. Um, so I wanna mention kind of why that is. Uh, we talked about filters. I mentioned briefly kernels. So kernel is the, the region uh, that we're applying the filter to. So for uh, a gradient, you basically have this. This is your kernel. It's values that we're kind of applying over that region. 
So we're gonna look at the, the pixel to the immediate left of the pixel we're working with, multiply it by 0 0.5. The one in the center, we're just gonna, you know, multiply it by zero. Uh, and then the one to the right, we're gonna multiply it by 0 0.5. So we basically average the difference uh, across that three pixel window. That's a gradient. Uh, a Sobel kernel is exactly the same idea. We just also look a little bit um, up and above and average just a little bit. And you do the same thing in the X and the Y. So it just kind of rounds out corners a little more. Um, Gradient's really useful. You want to use NumPy gradient anytime you care about real world units. The slope calculation is a great example. A Sobel filter is going to be more when you care about appearance and you want to smooth. You want that little bit of smoothing. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot more about types of smoothing and ways to do this because gradients are noisy. One of the things you'll notice when we did all this gradient calculation, look at how it emphasized these little blips here. I mean, these are just tiny little artifacts in the data. They're not a big deal, but gradients really pick them out. I mean, gradients are very sensitive to noise. So we're gonna talk a lot about ways to get around that. Uh, so let's talk about one of those. Another type of gradient, um, you can use a Gaussian gradient. So what we do, um, a Gaussian is a type, it's a bell curve, right? So. A Gaussian filter is very similar to that uniform filter we used earlier to uh, average the bathymetry. What's different about it is that it's smoother. So instead of just being a, a simple box average, it is, uh, you know, it's gonna very smoothly average. That means we can use a little bit wider window, but not blur as much. And when we blur, we won't, if we do a lot of blurring, it'll be very smooth looking. Uh, if you look at a uniform filter and you really look at large blurring amounts, you'll kind of see the square outlines. Uh, with a Gaussian filter, you get very nice, very uniform outlines. Uh, we can apply the same idea to a gradient calculation. So uh, a Gaussian gradient um, is the same idea. We just take that bell curve and essentially take its first derivative and then use that as a kernel. Um, actually doing that is a little bit different because what we'll do is we'll look at the uh, Gaussian filter 1D, the order one. Okay, so let me break this down just a touch. SciPy in the image has uh, a Gaussian filter function. That would be the full bell curve. However, it takes an order parameter and the order parameter says take the first derivative, second derivative, et cetera. So the first derivative of that bell curve is kind of this uh, wiggle, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, seismic like. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use kind of this as our convolutional filter. So what that means is we're gonna, average before we just looked at the pixel right beside and the pixel on the other side. Now we're gonna weight pixels that are over here a little less, pixels that are really close by a lot and pixels that are you know, uh, way over here a little less, but we're gonna smooth it out. That's all this is. Uh, so we're gonna take the Gaussian filter of order one, that's the Gaussian gradient. Uh, and then the gradient magnitude basically is just uh, you know, it has a built-in function to do Gaussian gradient magnitude. So there's, you can do this in one step. So I'm going to show the DX and DY, uh, but know that there is a built-in single step function to get Gaussian gradient magnitude, just because it's such a common calculation and there's some efficiencies you can apply. All right, talked a lot about it. Let me actually show you the difference. Um, and there we go. Definitely a little slower than I thought it was going to be. So my apologies for that. Ran faster last time. Okay. I am talking a whole lot about these, but I do want to make this point because we're going to keep on using this idea. Um, and that is we can use other types of gradients that are a little smoother uh, to look at what we want. This would not be a good thing if you're trying to do an exact slope calculation. It's not going to exactly represent the slope, but it's a great thing if you're trying to do kind of an average slope calculation. Uh, so it shows up a ton in image processing because we quite often want edges. We want slopes, but we don't really want every little bit of noise. If you imagine a photograph, we don't care about the noise. We want to look at, you know, the, the edge of the actual feature we're looking at. And this sort of approach um, is very useful for that. And you can see it here. We've, we've taken, this is the simple, straightforward mathematical gradient. This is a Gaussian gradient. And we've done a nice job of kind of smoothing out a lot of the noise. And as we expand this up, you can imagine smoothing it such that, you know, you don't even get these little blips at all. We smoothed them here, but we might just have a single like round bump for that entire seamount. And that's okay. Sometimes that's what you want. And it's very useful to be able to do that. So let's talk about how to control that. Um, we put in a sigma parameter here. I didn't mention it, but notice I said a sigma. Sigma is the size 
uh, it's the standard deviation of that bell curve. If you're thinking about it in terms of a normal distribution, that same bell curve shape. So we're talking about uh, the first derivative of that, this kind of, you know, down, up, uh, smooth waveform. So a larger sigma means that we have a big, smooth, broad shape. Um, a smaller sigma means that we have a tighter, narrower pulse. So sigma of five, that's in pixels. Uh, and that, you know, think of it like a standard deviation. It's, it does not exactly a width, but we can change that and see the results. So let's do that. Let's run this. Uh, we're going to have another little slider and we're going to go from zero to 20 um, and just kind of get a sense of it. So I'm, I'm going to, let's, let's do this here and you'll see it change. Um, not incredibly obvious until we get up to the higher values, but I'm going to zoom in on an area and let's, let's look at it in more detail. Um, so let's say, oops. Come on. All right. Don't know why this is being so stubborn. This is the one downside to using Matplotlib in notebooks. Uh, just for the record, if you run this outside of a notebook, it is much snappier. Um, I'm, I'm actually not a fan of notebooks for, uh, for actual use. I prefer them for teaching, but um, this slow interactivity is not actually Matplotlib. It's more the fact that it's not a web tool, it's meant for desktop use. Uh, so, you know, when you, uh, when you start trying to hop through multiple layers, things get slower than they should. Uh, anyway, now we have, you know, no smoothing. We can smooth a little bit and we'll see the result eventually. Um, but you get a sense for Sigma controlling how much smoothing we get. There we go, that was five, that's what we did before. If we put it all the way up at 20, you know, we're really gonna blur this out more. And it's just good to get an intuitive feel for kind of what these represent. Um, we're gonna come back to using the same idea of changing uh, a sigma in a, in a Gaussian distribution, a uh, Gaussian gradient function, a Gaussian uh, filter. We're gonna change that a lot. And so it's important to keep that in mind. These higher values are more smoothing. You're looking at larger changes and less at small local changes. Um, and it'll come up in, in all kinds of contexts. Okay, we've talked a whole heck of a lot about this. We've gone over gradients in great detail. Uh, let's actually do something with them. So uh, we have the C-mounts we were working with before. We, we calculated area. Um, for some cases, you might wanna calculate toe of slope. It's a simple thing to think about uh, from a geomorphic perspective. We might wanna find the edge of that C-mount and where we go back out to the abyssal plane. Um, you know, th there's a lot of reasons we might be looking for that, uh, but it's, it's a little bit, you know, if you think about it, it's not an immediately defined point, right? So we don't want the steepest part of the slope. We want where it actually finally goes back out to something being flat. But, you know, if we want to find that, how do we do it? We don't just want to look for, okay, where does the slope get high? If we just threshold on, on high slopes, we'll miss these more gentle cases. We actually want to look at it and if you think about it, what we're looking for are changes in the second derivative. We're looking where the inflection points are. So if we go back to these gradients being a first derivative, and so they're showing me the rate of change where the steep cliffs are. Uh, if we take that again, so another derivative, we're gonna show where the inflection points are. So where essentially we go from, you know, bending this way to bending that way. So these, these changes in curvature or, more precisely, where do we bend? Um, not just where is it steep, but where does it change steepness quickly? Uh, so that's curvature. Um, I'm only gonna talk about this a little bit, but in image processing, that's actually a Laplacian. Uh, well, not exactly. There's a Laplacian is a, a more specific operator, but uh, a Gaussian Laplace filter is doing exactly this with a Gaussian gradient magnitude. So, um, what we'll do is we'll look at curvature using a Gaussian Laplace filter. And all this really is, is looking at the second derivative of that Gaussian filter. So we could, we could take that and do it as what we did before. We took the, the Gaussian uh, filter with order one. We could put in order two and then look at the magnitude of that. It's essentially what this is doing. There's a one step for it that's Gaussian Laplace. Uh, and it's a very good way to find things like toe of slope, but it will show up again. We're trying to find ridges uh, in images. It's the same um, analogous idea. You know, if we're looking at trying to identify uh, some sort of lineament, this, this same idea will pop up. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at it very quickly. Oh, yep, I have to, uh, why is this RGB? That's silly.
oh, you know why it is? Hold on, this is the whole shaded plot that I didn't run. So if you're following along and your notebook did not crash, um, this will work. If you're like me and your notebook crashed, you're gonna need to go way back up and rerun that part where we did the hill shade. So it is this portion. So that RGB that it's referencing is calculated up here. And of course, I have to run this up here. Sorry, folks, one second. Didn't I just run this? This is one of the big downsides to notebooks. Uh, they let things get out of order. <laughs> In case you can't tell, I'm actually not a big fan of notebooks. Uh, I think they're great for use cases like this. Um, I think they're a very bad way to actually uh, run code and store your code just because uh, things like this happen and you're stuck with trying to go through and, and get things back in order. And yeah, you could rerun all the cells in order from the beginning, but that takes a while and you're better off actually having things um, in clear documented uh, code as opposed to notebooks. But what they're really great for is teaching um, and playing around with things like this, uh, giving people stuff they can easily tweak, run the results, you know, run and see the results of. So that's why uh, I'm using it here for teaching, um, even though I'm complaining about it as we go. <laughs> I also like to complain a lot, particularly about technology. All right, we are finally back to this. So the RGB was the hill shaded image. I just want to put it in the background because it looks good. But let's look at the results of our Laplacian filter we just did. So as a reminder, what we did was this uh, Gaussian Laplace. And let's go ahead and overlay it on our uh, imagery. So what we see is that we got high values. So this is positive curvature um, where we're kind of rounding you know, ridges like this that are up. And then we got negative values, which is, um, you know, kind of bending the other way. Actually, excuse me, these are negative, that's positive. That's because the bathymetry is negative values. Um, you know, we got these, these other values where we're kind of approaching the toe of the slope. So things like this. Uh, so if you look right there, what you'll see is that we get this value that's pretty high there. And that's the toe of the slope that we're looking for. Uh, so let's put on our, our C-mount um, classification back over this. So once again, let me just go back over that. You know, we got these high values where we had, you know, the ridge bending this way, and, or excuse me, low values with the blue. So low values with the ridge bends this way, that's just because bathymetry is negative. If bathymetry were positive values, you'd have it be the opposite. Uh, and then we got the other sign where it's bending this way. So we're looking at the, the curvature and the sign and magnitude of that curvature, which is a great way to find things like the top of a ridge, uh, well, the edge of the ridge um, and the toe of the slope. All right. Let's do that entire first exercise we did before, uh, if you recall that, and then let's compare it to what we're looking at. And we're gonna filter out all of the blue edges in this Gaussian Laplace. So let's just throw away everything that's in blue. Let's only look at the red portions, which are this, this shape curve that we're interested in. And that's what we do right here. So if you notice, we're gonna apply a threshold to it, which is saying, hey, give me something. And then if it's not above that threshold, just make it transparent. And what we see, all right. So what we've done here, um, we've got our, well, we'll get back to the C-mounts in a second, but we've overplayed anything that was inside uh, our C-mounts is not being interesting because we don't want stuff inside the C-mounts. And then we've actually taken uh, a threshold where we're looking at these red values um, and showing them here. And what we see is we pick up the C-mount detection pretty well. We're actually doing a pretty nice job. Uh, the reason that we, it's this whole part of doing the C-mount classification before, um, all it is is we took it, we reran it, um, we actually buffered it. I didn't talk about this, but binary dilation is, is one of the image morphology operations as a buffer. And we're just gonna remove anything that's kind of in the center of that C-mount. So let me show you why we did that. I'll go back to this one really quickly. Um, there's going to, uh, I cannot hear anything. Can folks hear me? Yes, we can. We can, we can hear okay. you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why my uh, audio is not coming through, but that's okay. Um, as long as folks can hear me, I think we're okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so 
<clears throat> my extreme apologies for that earlier. Uh, <laughs> that's what I get for uh, not running some of this stuff while Zoom is going earlier. I should have uh, checked everything, but I don't think I changed anything from last time, but it seems like I'm having much more trouble with, uh, with memory. So um, let's go ahead and run this, uh, make sure I don't have anything sitting around that shouldn't be open. And hopefully we will breeze through this next part. So thank all y'all for your patience. I am terribly sorry about the uh, technical difficulties I've been having. <laughs> and yeah, do we actually need it? No, we don't, because we'll need it later on. We will need this one. Um, no, we don't need that one. We need this one. Okay. All right. So let me get all the way back to where we were. Uh, so what we were doing is we were taking our, uh, do you, do you want to share your video? Joe? Uh, yes. My apologies, folks. Yeah, there you go. There we go. All right. I think we're good now. <clears throat> Getting ahead of myself. Uh, so let's let's quickly rerun. Oh, geez, where did I miss an import? Yep. Okay, I think we should be good. I don't actually care about the output for that, and that's okay. And this is what happens when you get halfway through notebooks and then decide to start running things partway through again. Um, I do want to point out why we're doing some of this though. So if you recall correctly, uh, I mentioned that we were going through and we're looking at toe of edges in the C mounts um, and that we'd done a little bit of filtering here. So what we did was we uh, took the Laplacian um, and I wanted to look for all the areas that are essentially red, which is slopes that are bending this way. Uh, but if you look at this, you'll also notice, well, if you look at the inside of the C mount, um, we actually have a bunch inside the seamount we don't care about. Admittedly, maybe these are arguably other seamounts, but stuff like that little ridge there, if you look at it, it goes to blue, it goes back to red briefly. Uh, so because of that, we'll use our seamount detection we did before, um, and we'll go ahead and say anything inside what we detected as a seamount, we don't care about. We don't want to know about the changes inside the seamount where it does this. We want to know about the changes just outside the seamount. So that's why this runs this classification, um, and then takes it, anything that's inside a seamount, uh, sets it to false, and then otherwise is looking for places where the convex convexivity is high and bending this way. So that's all this does. Um, and what we get indeed are these regions that are pretty reasonable approximations of the toe of slope around the seamounts. Okay, so we have this, they're yellow. We don't want a region though. What we really want is a nice, clear line that's the toe of slope. Um, the way we would get that is a skeletonization operation. So what this does is it takes a uh, this wide region and tries to reduce it down to a single pixel. Uh, this is another type of morphology operation. So I mentioned image morphology before. Um, I mentioned a lot of operations around finding connected regions. Uh, this is a similar one. Uh, and so skeletonization is what this is called. And it's gonna just make it a single line. And we're gonna go ahead and start using some stuff out of uh, socket image. And so socket image uh, morphology.skeletonize is one of the operators that does this. And let's go ahead and look at the result from that. All right, it's hard to see here. But let's say we zoom in on a C-mount. Um, what we'll see is that we actually got a pretty reasonable line and you know you have this sort of bifurcation. You'd want to do some cleanup before using this. We've actually gone through and gotten a, a pretty good toe of slope for these seamounts. Um, really, honestly, I know I spent a lot of time explaining it, but it's just a few lines of code, and it's snapping together uh, some Gaussian gradient magnitudes, uh, Gaussian Laplace more specifically. So we're going to the second order, um, and then doing some thresholding and filtering, and then finally a skeletonization operation uh, on that gradient. Uh, Gaussian uh, Laplace gradient works. So we're basically using different forms of gradients um, and then applying additional filtering that we have kind of talked about before, as long as some uh, mathematical image morphology to get this down to a single line. 
cleanup of these, trying to get like things, the, the dangling uh, parts that you don't care about, or, you know, finding the parts that you do out of these splits. Uh, that's a different task. There are some ways to do it, but it's always a bit difficult. I'm not going to cover those, but you can imagine doing similar sorts of filtering to clean up uh, spurious little bits, um, the little parts that hang off and just leave like the longest continuous line. There's analogous operations to a lot of this cleanup uh, that, that is available, although it's always a little hard to find out what you want to clean up and what you want to leave. So that's always the trick to doing these things uh, automatically. You always have a bit of noise, but still, that's not bad. Okay. Uh, I've talked about this a whole heck of a lot. Um, let me put another sort of thing to think about is how would you change this, you know, to do a better job? How would you uh, maybe avoid some of these little regions? Uh, how would you, you know, just maybe get the, the slopes of, you know, the bigger seamounts? Um, you know, think about what you might be interested in from this analysis, uh, and then think about ways to, um, you know, to do that with the tools we've talked about. So just kind of build on this. Uh, there's a lot you can change, a lot you can play around with, but yeah, uh, hopefully this this gives some ideas. We're going to use these same ideas, particularly the skeletonization and edge detection sort of stuff. So here we detected, uh, you know, one type of ridge. We're going to come back to it with aerial photography. So our next section is really going to build on this. Um, so in that, we're going to look at some aerial photographs, and we're going to try to detect uh, what's mostly fracture sets, but some some clear uh, lineaments uh, in those aerial photography. In that aerial photography, and it's very clear by eye. You could easily digitize it, uh, but we're going to talk about some ways you can do it automatically. So, um, with that in mind, uh, I basically took a break with the <laughs> the whole uh, technical difficulties. So I'm going to try to answer some questions, uh, and then we'll kind of move on to the next section. So I'm going to hop over back into the Gitter room, uh, and I'll try to answer a few of the questions that have popped up. So, um, and my apologies for all the uh, laptop completely crashing. Uh, I did not expect that to happen. So <laughs> uh, thanks for bearing with me. Um, all right, so going back to some of the questions, uh, you're asking about uh, so uh, quantifying the size or area of a, a certain feature in an image. So if you look at that uh, seamount detection problem, what that always, always boils down to is finding a way to segment uh, that image. So you want to come up with some sort of operation that can define in a Boolean sense. So one zero, we are in this region, we are not. Find out with some way that you can classify that. Once you have that, it's very easy to get the size and area because you can count pixels and turn those back into areas. So um, hopefully that that kind of makes sense. Um, you know, looking back at the um, the examples in that earlier notebook, uh, we we sort of did that. the The trick is always uh, determining what that certain feature is. That's the hard part. The size and area are easy once you actually have the, the something that will identify uh, the feature you're interested in. And that's a very good question, by the way. And I apologize for responding to it uh, this way and not in typing, but uh, hopefully that does answer it. Uh, next question is about basic rule of thumbs determine appropriate kernel size. That's a very, very good question. I I don't have a simple answer because sometimes there isn't one, but the best thing to think about is the physical scale of the features you're trying to detect. So the kernels are usually specified in pixels for this sort of work. So think about how many pixels um, the feature that you're trying to emphasize or identify, how wide is it? So if you're interested in things that are you know, 100 pixels wide and you really don't care about things that are 10 pixels wide, that tells you your filter should probably be down somewhere, you know, around 10 pixels and a little bigger maybe, because you want to put it based on what you want to exclude. Um, and then what you want to emphasize most uh, is a little harder to figure out, but your filter sizes quite often will be around what you want to leave out. And then, you know, you, you will try to get, uh, I, in a lot of cases, you know, you're really interested in large features. It's gonna be hard to see. You want a really big filter you have to play around with it and see what works best. But so I think it's most often useful to think about what you want to exclude and then how big are the features that you're most interested in because that kind of gives you some bounds on it. So hopefully that makes some sense. It's a very, very good question. Um, so uh, what image surface condition the median, uh, is the median filter not suitable for? So median filters, um, what they do, you can apply them to a lot of different, uh, a lot of different data, but it's always going to be leaving values in that are already in the data set. A median filter will never introduce a value that didn't already exist. So um, a median filter should only be used when you have 
I used it for classified data. So ones and zeros, it makes sense for that. In that case, it's cleaning up shapes, but you would often use it for spike removal. So let's say we have um, a data set that's, that's very noisy. Um, medium, medium filter will often remove spikes without smoothing edges. The case where you wouldn't want to use it is when you want to smooth edges. So a medium filter typically will not really smooth edges. It will try to give you uh, a sharp break. And that's exactly uh, because it's not influenced by outliers. Um, so anytime that you want to basically, so it's not influenced by outliers, but it's also not going to, it's going to try to give you, it's going to clean up the little noise, but try to leave a sharp edge where you've got uh, a big change. If you want to smooth that edge out, a medium filter is a very poor choice because it's not influenced by the outliers. So when we go over it, well, this, this, uh, you know, these things over here and down there are outliers. You actually want to bend that edge. Uh, that's when a Gaussian filter and other uniform filters are more appropriate. It's just kind of a, you know, uh, whether you want to keep sharp edges or do you want to smooth them. Uh, ooh, that is an excellent question, Val. Uh, okay, so. Slope detection around deep water lobes. Uh, I, I think, you know, that's that is the type of thing you could definitely look at. Um, one thing I will say is, if you wanted to do that um, with image processing sort of techniques, and you have uh, backscatter data from, is this, I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about modern stuff here, but if you have uh, backscatter data from a, a multi-beam bathymetry survey, um, I would actually try to do that instead of slope. Um, so just because what you're going to pick up is actually the, the sand versus mud sort of bottom uh, can often be more obvious. Now, obviously not all deep water lobes are defined by uh, what's deposited there per se. You're going to get a lot of mud there. You want to define the morphology of it, but uh, your backscatter data is really nice for it. That having been said, that wasn't really your question. Your question was, are they too subtle to pick out with a toe of slope? And that depends on the detail of your bathymetric survey. If you have a really good multi-beam survey, you can absolutely use these methods to pick out very subtle features um, like you know, subtle depositional lobes. The issue is that you're also going to pick up a lot of other things you may not be interested in. So the more subtle the feature is, the harder, the more other stuff you're going to have that you're going to detect. Um, so you need one, a very high res bathymetry scan. Uh, and if you have that, you have multi-beam. And if you have multi-beam, you probably have backscatter. And that's why I mentioned backscatter. <laughs> um, but the second thing is you would need to uh, have a have something where they're pretty clearly defined, just because otherwise you're going to pick up every little bit of noise in the data, every um, random bit of chatter. And very quickly, deep water lobes. Uh, I don't know if that already got answered, but I'll, I'll answer it. Um, basically, when you have uh, a deep marine sedimentation, uh, you're essentially going to get, well, actually here, uh, it's been answered better than, better than I would answer it. So uh, you're going to get features where you essentially have, you know, things running out onto the abyssal plane that, that have these low bait uh, kind of very subtle shapes, but very large. And they're very, very uh, important if you're interested in understanding where there might be, say, reservoir uh, in deep water. And yeah, exactly, a submarine fan. Uh, yeah, and I'm not a sedimentologist, although I always wanted to be one. I kept on trying to go into fluvial sedimentology and winding up back in, uh, back in marine geophysics. So that's my, uh, my story. <laughs> okay, um, we've taken enough breaks, I think. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next section. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions, but uh, I think we're probably, probably good to go. So if anyone would like a little more time, uh, please speak up. Otherwise, I'll just kind of go ahead and, and keep moving on to the next section here. So uh, keep my throat from getting too dry. OK, um, let's talk for a second about linear analysis. So that's kind of what we've been doing before. This is, by the way, the section where stuff actually starts to get really fun. It's also the section where I'm going to spend a lot less time explaining the building blocks and move a little quick. Uh, so I'm happy to go back and break this down afterwards if folks have questions. but. This is the fun stuff. We're going to start throwing some uh, some crazier operators and images, and start to do stuff that I think people will immediately recognize as like, hey, that's a problem I've I've actually had before. Uh, so let's pull in some aerial photography. All right. So this is uh, NAPE is a USDA, so you know U.S. based aerial photography program for the U.S. That's a bit redundant, but uh, it's free data and it's pretty high resolution. And so it's it's a great resource if you're uh, doing you know any sort of local mapping. Uh, it's well worth pulling up some of the imagery to have as the backdrop. Uh, and one of the things you quite often wind up wanting to do is you know try to map out the fracture patterns and the like. Uh, it, 
it's a lot of reasons you might want to do that, but they're pretty obvious here. Uh, so this is, if you notice, we look here, all right, they're a little subtle when we zoomed in, but you can see particularly vegetation growing in some of these fractures. Uh, makes sense. They're going to basically have water there. It's a very arid area, so anything the, the roots can get into to find water. But you can see these lining up pretty nicely, um, and they're kind of all over. That's what we're going to work with here. We're going to try to look at ways we can detect these and actually uh, look at orientations. So a task you might have if you're looking at fracture sets is just, hey, what are my, what are my fracture orientations and what are the different orientations we have? Um, and Quite often you can't fully automate that. Quite often you wanna go back and do a manual approach uh, because you, you care about what you're getting. But sometimes an automated approach is a very quick, useful thing to get a sense of you know, where things are um, and get a lot of features, even if you're not necessarily confident about each individual one, but look at the orientations. Um, and we're gonna do that here. So I do wanna mention a little bit about what the data is. Uh, I mentioned aerial photography, but it's also RGB data. So we've gone from looking at a single band value to looking at uh, three band color data. So this case, it's red, green, blue bands. Uh, so this is, you know, actually is multispectral, although it's just color. Uh, and Rasterio has a different convention around band order than Matplotlib. So I do want to mention something here. Uh, Rasterio always puts bands on the first axis. It's great to use Rasterio, you know, use it anytime you're reading in GeoTIFFs or the raster data. But um, it, it will put the red band in the first axis, you know, and the blue band in the second, red in the third. So it's, it's in the, the, all in the first axis though. And then the width and height are the other two. Uh, and that convention is the opposite of matplotlib, which puts height, then width, then the number of bands last. Uh, both conventions are extremely common. It's not that either one is wrong. It's that the bands first is kind of a little more common in the geospatial world and bands last is a little more common in the image processing world. Um, so you're gonna have to move back and forth between them a lot. There's a single uh, NumPy function that makes that very easy and that's move axis. So anytime you wanna move between these two conventions, move axis, and this just says swap the first axis with the last axis, which is all the different conventions are. So I just wanna mention that because uh, it's very handy to know about, it, it'll pop up a lot. All right, now we're gonna be looking at liniments. I'm actually gonna throw away the color information. We don't care about color too much for this. Uh, we'll, we'll do more with color here in a second, but let's just look at grayscale textures. So we've got red, green, blue. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the mean of the values. It's a very simple way of getting grayscale. Uh, and notice I say mean axis negative one, that's the last axis. So averaging over the bands um, and just get a grayscale image out. Uh, this is easier because it's a single band of data. You can do the same analysis with color data, but then you get three results and you have to decide how you wanna combine those three results. Um, other things use color in other ways. Like we might try to pick out uh, the fact that vegetation is here, it's a little more green. So we might use that information in some of this analysis. I'm not gonna do that here, but you can think about it. Um, what I'm gonna focus on for this section is really the textural elements that are equally well-defined by grayscale. All right, so we've got a grayscale image, simple mean. It works. Let's go ahead and go back to what we were doing before. We did um, gradient magnitude as an edge detector. Well, it makes an edge detector last time. So let's go ahead and just use the Sobel filter. So we didn't care about values. I mentioned Sobel filters really commonly used in image processing. Let's run it on this. Let's see what we get. Uh, and I'll toggle this over the original imagery. All right, so we have our color imagery in the background. We're running a Sobel filter actually on the gray result, even though I'm gonna show the color result in the background. So let's toggle on the Sobel filter and toggle it off. And then I'm gonna zoom into an area um, to look at. So, all right, Sobel filter, well, gradient magnitude from a Sobel filter. Sobel filter gives you two numbers. Remember dx, dy, uh, we're taking the magnitude of those. It's, it's interesting, you know, we're, we're seeing stuff. We're, we're seeing stuff that, hey, that, that's a lame and it kind of lines up. Um, if I zoom back out here, now let's, let's look at, uh, yeah, hold on. let's look at these guys there. I think, uh, a very obvious one. Uh, yeah, you can you can see this. It's picking out the edges. We, we're doing a good job of identifying edges in this. But if we wanted to do linear analysis on this, this is pretty noisy. Um, it's a lot of stuff going on. And that's one of the key things with gradients. They are sensitive to noise, right? So let's go back to some of those other methods we talked about, uh, particularly the Gaussian gradient magnitude uh, to make it less noisy. Uh, so we're going to use a sigma of three. Um, 
and you're asking about rules of thumb for, for what we don't care about or rules of thumb for how to pick the, the thresholds. Well, Sigma's not exactly a width. It's, it's in pixels, but again, it's a standard deviation. So it's a little wider than, uh, than just a straight width. But if something's three pixels wide, we probably don't care about it too much. So that's a good rule of thumb for, for that Sigma being three here. The truth is grab one, see what it looks like, change it, uh, see what you think. So let's do that. Let's look at the Sobel. Uh, what's that noisy one? Gaussian gradient magnitude. All right. We're looking at it zoomed out, but suddenly we can already see the Gaussian gradient magnitude is doing a much better job of picking out the edges we actually care about. So if I zoom in here, we've still got a lot of noise. We've still got a lot going on, but at least we're, we're getting these bigger edges nicely simplified. Whereas before, yeah, we saw them, but how do we identify that edge from, from you know, this stuff over here? And how do we identify maybe you know, some of these features that we're also interested in um, you know, compared to the rest of the chatter? So the Gaussian gradient magnitude is very good for this, just because the images are often uh, noisier than, than the stuff we're looking at. It's not, it's real data, but we want to filter out some of the trees and bushes and shadows, and we want to look more at, at larger scale patterns. Okay, so we have this Gaussian gradient magnitude. That's what's shown here. Again, black values are high. So the simplest thing we could think about doing is similar to what we did earlier. We, we could just say, okay, give me all the values with high Gaussian gradient magnitude. It's a simple threshold, right? So let's run that. All right, we're gonna say, show me everything that that threshold is greater than five. And we might, we might play around with this. Let's go threshold greater than seven. It's not gonna change it a whole lot. What if I did greater than like one, uh, not 100, let's do like 50. You know, you start to see it get down. Okay, we could do 100, you get the idea. We can play around with it. Let's go back to five. Um, but, Oh, hey, I had a slider to do that. Well, <laughs> uh, let me zoom in and, and use the slider that I put in here to do the same thing. Uh, and, and you can really see the result. So uh, I forgot my own notebooks content there, folks. Um, but as we go up, what we're seeing is it's a higher threshold. So we're requiring more and more values, uh, more and more uh, gradient magnitude, a higher value of gradient magnitude to be counted. And as we go up, you know, we are starting to identify features we care about. Like this is definitely one, that's one. You know, these individually aren't, but that line of them is. So we, we're picking up stuff that's that's relevant. It's just that there's a lot of irrelevant stuff mixed in here. Um, so, you know, we also look over here, you know, we're getting a lot of these things that are these, these features we're interested in, but we're just picking up spots of them, right? They're not continuous. All right, so you might imagine if we uh, skeletonize it. So we did that before with the slopes, right? We took and we skeletonized um, the, the regions that we have. So we could skeletonize these same things. But let's do one better than that. We're looking at this feature. You know, gradient magnitude, it, it didn't take a whole lot to, to join up. Like when we dropped down to like four, we joined up this entire thing. But then we have like values over here, you know, we're pretty high. You can imagine not doing a strict threshold. Like if we're moving along through here and we've got a high, we've got a high value over there and a high value over here and a little lower in between, we can connect up these values that are a little lower, but are connected to high value regions, but leaving out all these cases where, yeah, it's high, but there's nothing around it that's high. Uh, and then skeletonizing that result. That sounds like a complicated description, but there's a single operator that does that. And that's called the canny operator. So a canny uh, edge detector is basically taking the gradient magnitude, um, skeletonizing it, but then using a skeletonizing operation that looks at adjacent values. So it's not just a straight, give me the center of this region. It's a, well, let's use the actual values and connect them if it's, you know, if it's a little dip in between two high values. Canning filter is pretty neat. It's incredibly useful. Um, it's uh, pretty fast to run and it will actually do a reasonably decent job of picking these up. So this is the canning filter. We've taken the gradient magnitude. We've kind of done a, a, a little bit of a loose threshold. So we are trying to line things up and we've skeletonized it down to where each one of these things is one pixel wide and we're getting the edges. We are nicely picking out these edges of these things that are pretty, you know, um, amorphous like this this bit of trees here is not incredibly clearly defined you know those those are different but we're picking up the edges we care about uh this is you know one operation it's a single function call and we've got something that's maybe not useful yet but you know this this is uh we're getting there so let's 
let's move on from this. Let's say, all right, we've got these things. We've, we've done a pretty good job of picking up the, the boundaries of these with this canny filter. Um, let's go ahead and think about getting orientations from that. So these are all one pixel wide regions, right? We could turn these into lines. So we could also look at uh, ways to get linear features out of this. So we have an image here. This, this yellow thing is our image, but what, what lines up? What, um, where are the cases where all of these kind of line up? We want to look for linear features in this. We want to filter out things that are curved, rounded blobs and find things that are big, long lines. All right, that's another type of image processing uh, operation. So uh, actually, let me answer this question really quick because it's a good one. Uh, is, is the canny filter directional in terms of connecting high values? And uh, the answer is that it depends. It, it, it is, but it's not a set direction. So it is directional in the sense that it's looking at what it's done um, right before then. So it's, it's a kind of locally defined direction. So actually here, the uh, let's see if there's a simple, uh, anyway. What it's doing is it's basically looking at where, yeah, so where we've gone recently. So it's directional in the sense that it's looking for the recent uh, direction that the, the image has been moving in. It's not directional in the sense of filter things based on a Northwest azimuth. However, you could imagine doing exactly that. So if we go back up to the skeletonized Gaussian gradient magnitude, you could imagine running a filter that specifically looks for things um, in a particular orientation. To do that, you would actually, I won't go into it, but you would design, uh, it'd be a simple convolutional filter and you would design an element that essentially runs the direction you wanna go. And when you apply that, uh, you'll, you'll filter out things that don't run in that direction. Um, there's a few ways you can do that, a few tricks to it, but that's the basic idea. Uh, but yeah, it's directional, but not uniformly directional. All right, bit of an aside, but it was a really good question and uh, it it's, feeds right into what we're doing. Another thing though is, the thing I was talking about where we would apply some sort of known direction, that would be a bad thing for this use case. We don't wanna force our um, linear analysis to only look for things at a known orientation, right? We want it to find its own orientation. So the way, one way you can do that is uh, a huff transform, ho transform, huff, huff transform. I, you'll hear a thousand different pronunciations. I'll, I'll say huff transform here. I usually say ho transform because that's what I weirdly always heard it a long time ago, which is wrong. Um, but the basic idea is it's a way of finding straight lines. It's actually a very simple concept. We take this image, you can imagine this, this the yellow part that we're all we're thinking about. And we, let's say we sum things, we sum things vertically, we sum each column of pixels. And then we rotate that by a degree each time. And then we sum them and we look at the result, the rotation, and then the values that we get. And if we line up with the linear feature, we're gonna get a very high sum at that location. That's a Huff transform. Uh, it's just a constant rotation and summing. And what it does is it's a good way of detecting infinite straight lines. Um, if any of you just happen to do EBSD analysis, so electron, electron backscatter diffraction, uh, you know, you, you're finding these crystal patterns, right? Or actually this X-ray crystallography in general. Uh, so you use X-ray crystallography, you find these straight lines and you wanna know where the lines are and where they intersect. You actually use a Huff transform for that. So uh, it's, it's a great way of finding these infinite lines. Here's the catch. We don't care about infinite lines. We actually want lineaments. We want to know it started here, it ended there. That's not an infinite line. Uh, so that's actually not what a Huff transform gives. It gives an Y equals AX plus B sort of thing. Um, we can use a different type though. There's a probabilistic Huff transform. And what that will essentially do is try to find segments that are some sort of length we'll give it. We'll say, hey, we're looking for segments about this long find me segments using a Huff transform, but doing it very loosely and trying to figure out where they actually stop and end. Uh, let's apply that to this canny filtered edges. So we're gonna take the, the canny filter we already ran and we're gonna look for linear features in it. And we're actually gonna try to find starts and ends of those linear features. This is actually like pretty, you know, not straightforward stuff to code up from scratch. But the nice thing is this stuff is directly in a lot of these uh, libraries that we have easy access to. So um, socket image has probabilistic ho line, uh, probabilistic F line. This is exactly what we wanna do. It's a single line of code and we can get something that's not too crazy. So let's run it. All right, 
what we're doing here is we're going to change something. We're going to change the line length we're looking for. If we look for short lines, we're going to find a lot of them. If we look for longer lines, we're going to find fewer of them. If that makes sense, or we're likely to find fewer of them. Uh, so we can change this value of lines we're looking for. There's actually two components to this. I'm not going to get too far into, but um, it's basically, I call it a gap ratio here. Um, there's the line length that it takes and the line gap. And for the cases of this slider, I've just said, well, if we're looking for long lines, we're probably sensitive to a longer gap. If we're looking for short lines, we want a shorter gap. So I've just made it a ratio between the two. They are independent things you can change. But basically the, the idea is the same. How long a feature are we looking for? And then how much gaps will we tolerate to call it the same feature? That's the idea of those two parameters. Um, and as we start doing this, we, we get up to higher values. Hey, we're actually picking out the stuff we care about. Now, there's one caveat with this. These are all essentially the same length um, feature. We, we have said we want things with 29 pixels. So we're getting 29 pixel long lines. Uh, and notice they kind of jump around depending on exactly what we pick. It's, it's, not, it's not a great way of finding all of the features, all of the lineaments, but it's a good way of getting the orientation um, automatically of a few of these. And that's really what it's most useful for. It's like, I don't want to find every single one, but I want to get the orientation of, of stuff that looks linear. All right. We played around with that slider. We changed the line length to be longer. That gave us fewer, longer, more continuous line segments. Um, I actually left it in a pretty bad spot, but it still, we can tune those values and get something a little better. So let's go ahead and I'll use some pre-tuned things. So I played around with this and line length of 30 with a line gap of five works pretty nicely. Um, we have lines for these. That means they have orientations. We can make a rose diagram. So what this will do, this will run the same thing. We'll get line segments. Um, we'll make a rose diagram of those line segments and just see what it looks like. All right, so this is the, the optimized settings. Um, we're picking out a lot of interesting features um, and we get a rose diagram and we see that indeed, well, most of them trend the way we'd expect. Uh, there are a lot that trend this way. That's actually shadows. Um, we'll get into that in a second. But the sun illumination is from this direction, so we get a lot of shadows running this way. Uh, but you know, hey, this is it's not it's not bad. It's still useful. We're not doing a very good job of picking out individual prominent lineaments. Like I would really like that one to be digitized. It didn't get that. But what it did do is it gave us a pretty reasonable orientation distribution. Uh, and so this is uh, one option that's that's pretty useful and it's good to know about. Uh, we're not necessarily trying to get everything, but we're trying to get orientations of features. So let's see if we can't do better. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into another pretty fancy, pretty advanced uh, method. And I had more time. I would break this down and explain this in a lot more detail. But this is a method that comes up all the time in geology. It's used... Um, so if any of you are familiar with coherence and seismic, uh, it's very closely related to that. Um, if you're familiar with structurally oriented filters, uh, they actually often use this to define the structure that they're filtering. Um, if you're interested in um, finding out uh, orientations, uh, so like slope in, or a dip in seismic data, so like automatically getting, hey, what is, what is the local uh, dip here? This is another thing that shows up for that. It shows up in... Uh, topographic, so in geomorphology, there's a, um, a host of uh, topographic features. I forget exactly what they're called, but it's, it's a way of doing automated analysis, and it really actually is a structure tensor. Uh, and then more importantly, it's going to be very familiar to any of you who have done uh, shape preferred orientation analysis or um, anyone who's heard of a Flynn plot. So looking at strain and uh, ratios of, of orientations, you know, basically are we looking at like, hey, is it flattened? Is it elongate? Um, that actually comes back into very similar stuff to a structure tensor. Here's what it is. We're going to take the gradient at every point. All right, so we have a, a vector, you know, a dx, dy. We're going to take a moving window of all of those vectors within some region. We're going to take the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of those individual slope vectors. That sounds fancy. All we're basically saying is how uniformly do they point in one direction or do they point in all different directions? Are they, you know, um, how, 
how much is the same direction? What is that direction? But also like, what's the ratio? So you can think about it as lining all these vectors up and it's not exactly just where do they sum? That's a slightly different calculation, but it's a similar idea. It's like, are we looking for things that are all the same? And then what's what's the anisotropy of it? Do they all go in one direction really strongly? Um, do they, are they small, but all going in the same direction? Do they go in like different directions, but you know, it's 60% one, 40% the other. Uh, that's the sort of information this gives us. So we actually get, um, we actually get a, a full, so we get a covariance matrix that then we can take some, some eigenvalues and eigenvectors of. So we're going to get, take a bunch of vectors, take a moving window and get eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of those. It sounds like a lot. If you're familiar with all the steps, it's, it's kind of makes sense intuitively. It's just working with the orientation data. That's all this is. So if you're used to working with the orientations, you know, you're just taking a bunch of these orientations and looking at properties of that distribution. We can do that on the image though. It's regularly spaced. We have gradients at every point. We can run this for every single pixel and we can get out a actual, you know, set of eigenvectors and eigenvalues for each one of these based on the orientations all around it. So, all right. I've said a lot about that. I haven't explained it graphically, but hopefully it makes a little bit of sense. Um, what this does, and the reason this is so nice for a lot of this type of analysis, it tells us how aligned image gradients are. It tells us how large those image gradients are in their alignment. Like, do we have a bunch of small ones that are all aligned or do we have a bunch of big ones that are all aligned? So it tells us that information. It will tell us, you know, not only just like, what's the anisotropy of it? Are we going, strongly along a consistent direction, or are we a little more fuzzy? Uh, there's a lot of information we can get out of this. And it gives us an actual orientation of that. So in some ways, you can think about it as a way of averaging your orientations, but averaging them in a way that gives you more information. Uh, we're going to take the same data. We're going to read it in, uh, turn it to grayscale, and we're going to run the structure tensor. Now, this thankfully is just a like, hey, socket image has a structure tensor uh, function built in. If you want to write this from scratch, it's a fair bit of code. It would be really slow. That's the biggest problem. There's some big optimizations you can make, uh, but it's conceptually simple. And then we'll, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we get that. The structure tensor itself gives you three components of a symmetric two by two, assuming this is two dimensional and this is always two dimensional for this, this function. Um, so we're actually getting three components of this, you know, two by two tensor, uh, because it's symmetric. We only get three, I only need three. We can then compute the eigenvalues of that very efficiently because it's a symmetric two by two matrix. Um, you don't need to use your normal, like you'd use eig or eigh if you know it's symmetric, um, but there's algebraic ways of doing it when it's only two by two. And structure tensor eigenvals just happens to give a, a function that does that algebraic approach, um, taking these three instead of the full four, it's just a handy thing. So we've got basically uh, two eigenvalues back out of this two by two uh, tensor. And we can actually, it, because this is two by two and the properties of it, we know it's symmetric. We can actually get the eigenvectors from the two eigenvalues. Um, we're interested in the eigenvectors. So eigenvectors give you the orientation. Eigenvalues give you how strongly aligned is it? So is it you know a bunch of stuff going in one direction or is it kind of more uniform? Is it a lot of change or is it a little change? They give you that. The vectors give you which direction is it going in? We need both. We want to know, look for things where it's all aligned in the same direction, but we also need to know what that direction is. So that's why we're doing this uh, this quick switch it over to the single, the, the eigenvector corresponding to the single largest eigenvalue. Okay. So we've got a vector at every pixel that we're saying like, okay, this is, this is the alignment of the orientations. We don't want all of them. We only want the ones that have a large consistent magnitude. You know, we're all going in the same direction. So we're going to filter out a lot of them. Um, again, we're going to take this vector, the magnitude of it is how, how large that change is aligned in that direction. Uh, so it's a good, large values of magnitude will be lots of change in a consistent direction. Now there's one little trick here. Uh, I kind of haven't mentioned this, but I, well, I don't want to get too bad. I, I used a trick here. The gradient would be across the lineament, right? If we have, uh, bright to dark, and we have that consistently in one direction. Well, the gradient would actually run the opposite way. Um, so when I grab the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue, I got the magnitude of the large one that runs perpendicular to what we're interested in, but I actually put the orientation um, in the other direction. And I, I glossed over that in this negative sign. So 
I don't want to get too far down the weeds here, but we're going to try to align the orientation that things are going in and not perpendicular to that. Okay. Sorry, I'm rambling so much here. Hopefully that makes some sense. We're going to filter out only those that are in the top 10th percentile. And then just for plotting, I'm going to leave out every 10th one. So this is a lot of explanation. I probably should have broken this down into more parts, but uh, this is kind of the cool part. These are our detected vectors. Now we're not trying to get exactly start and end points. Um, what we're trying to do is just get a bunch of these points where they're large, show me the orientation. So this doesn't really give me a start and an end. This is not immediately uh, what we would really want in terms of I have digitized this, this fracture set, but it's giving me a ton of really good information about their orientation. Um, and you can imagine other things where we start to line up things that are you know strong and oriented in the same direction, line them up and connect them. And so you do have approaches that can do that. But I'm not going to talk about those today. What I do want to say is we've done this. We've pretty consistently picked out the features that we're interested in. Interested in. Uh, so you know, really, this 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 guy here, we're consistently getting large uh, large eigenvectors along the edge of that, and we're getting them at every single pixel essentially that we're plotting. Uh, so we're doing a good job of, of really showing it. And if we look at the rose diagram, this is kind of the cool part. If you look at this very closely, one we see this obvious trend through here. But as we move over here and you look at it really closely, we actually start to see a slightly different orientation over in this area. So this orientation is actually a little different than that orientation. Um, and it's a little subtle. So I'm going to zoom in here. You know, if we look here, it's trending kind of more this way. And then if we look uh, here, it's going to be trending a little more, you know, this way. So it's actually kind of hard to pick out by eye. Um, but it shows up nicely in this analysis. We actually get this bimodal distribution. We still get a bunch of stuff due to the sun. So actually, if we look here, um, we're just picking up these guys. Those are shadow related um, vegetation, et cetera. But you know, they don't really contribute that much to the full thing. So it's, it's just, it's kind of neat that we ran this automated process. And it actually does pick out what we see by eye. It's getting a lot of stuff we don't care about, but the overall, we get a pretty reasonable uh, distribution of fracture sets um, and with, you know, a little bit of tuning, but not really a lot of um, detailed digitizing. So that's, I think, the where some of these things can be very useful. Hopefully, this is a problem that I think people can see the utility of. Um, and in a lot of cases, you'd want to take the next step. You'd want to get these vectors, but then connect them up into actual digitized lineaments. Um, and that part is very doable. Um, there's a lot of ways to approach it, but it's always the harder step. <laughs> so I stopped here for that reason. Um, if you're interested in connecting them up, um, I'm blanking on the methods. The basic idea is that you pick a random starting point and then you look at, you know, you pick a random starting point with a high magnitude. Um, and then you look in the direction of that magnitude, find another feature that's less than some pixels away um, that's also a high magnitude. And you just start connecting things until you drop below some threshold and then you go in the opposite direction. And you repeat that uh, for a bunch of random points until you've collected in features. That's the algorithm that, that those use. And I've forgotten the exact name of it, um, but that's, that's essentially it. Uh, it works okay. You can get fancier. Uh, there's a whole host of these sort of line painting algorithms. But uh, yeah, this is pretty useful just for what it is. All right. I've talked a lot here. Let me take a quick drink of water. So let's go ahead and move on to the next thing. And I, I do apologize because these, these sections, um, you'll notice. Uh, at, so that's a good question. SK image does not have an algorithm for connecting lines. Um, at least it didn't last I checked. It might now. Uh, there are some other things that do. But unfortunately, a lot of the uh, connecting line sort of algorithms are in a lot of proprietary libraries or are stuff that you tend to code up from scratch because it's always a little different for every use case. Um, it, I, I wish I had a better answer for you than that. There are some open libraries that has it that have it. Mahotas was one, but Mahotas hasn't been maintained in a while. So unfortunately, yeah, right now it's probably easiest to code that up. Um, but I, I think there's some stuff out there. Um, I'm just blanking on what it is. Mahotas had one that would connect up lines. There's a couple others. Uh, anyway, there, there's there's some stuff you can do with that. But coding it up from scratch is also an option because it's a little different for every problem. Uh, so things like uh, digitizing lines from a scanned map is a really common problem. And you have a very similar analogous sort of thing to this. 
but the way you actually get a good solution is very different. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I wish I had a better answer for you on that one. Okay, let's go ahead and go on to uh, completely swap scale. So one of the cool things about image processing is that it doesn't care about scale. Uh, we can go to very large scale stuff. We worked with all of the Western Pacific. We worked with an aerial, photog aerial photograph of a few kilometers. Let's jump all the way down to a thin section. Uh, so I'm gonna load in uh, a couple thin sections. These are from the British, uh, oh, British Geological Survey, but I forget exactly what they call the image collection. Um, and what we're going to look at is some metamorphic uh, thin sections. This is uh, an amphibolite. And we'll look at the plane polarized light and cross polarized light. So I'm going to say a little bit about what this is. Um, so when we're looking at the, the plane polarized light, uh, we're basically only seeing, you know, we're seeing light transmitted through. It is polarized light for various reasons. Um, so we're seeing basically how transparent things are. There's information to be gleaned here. Um, but when we put in the cross polars, what this is doing is it's giving us an interference pattern. Uh, and I won't explain what this is to too much of a degree. Uh, the color itself doesn't mean a whole lot beyond that it it's, can reach a high birefringence. We'll, I'll talk a little bit about what this is. It doesn't mean much, but it means that a given color, you've got a bunch of things in that same orientation. Now, the fact that we're getting out to these purple colors and not these more subtle yellows or grays, uh, actually the yellows and the, the, the grays are, it has to do with the anisotropy of light uh, along the crystal. So you have a fast axis and a slow axis of a crystal. Some crystals have much more strong, much stronger anisotropy of, of the speed of light through the crystal. That's what the color can tell you. It doesn't tell you exactly anything in particular because depending on the orientation, um, you know, you may get a low value, but the fact that we're seeing these purples at all means that we're looking at something that has a high anisotropy. In this case, those are amphiboles. Um, so it, seeing the colors can tell you a lot. You rotate the axis, you can see them change. You know, that, that lets you know um, a bit about the minerals you're working with. I'm not gonna say a whole lot about this. You can tell I am not a petrologist, but I just wanna mention what the colors you're looking at are. Um, they're related to the crystal orientation and the anisotropy of the speed of light through that crystal. And we get a diffraction or a, a birefringence pattern um, when, uh, when we change that. So uh, it's, it's very useful for investigating things. But what's really nice for is identifying things that are the same mineral grain. So these are all, uh, all in the same orientation. So the crystal orientation is all the same for everything in this, this purple color here. So that's one mineral grain. Um, and, you know, similar over here. So before, you know, with the plain polarized light, you can see grain boundaries when it's obvious, but through here, you know, that's probably not all one grain. And we go with the cross polars, and indeed, uh, you know, we, we can see it broken up because uh, we're seeing different crystal orientations. And one of the things we can do with this is try to classify different grains. We might want to do, we might want to say, okay, separate this grain from that grain over there, from that grain, from that grain. We're going to base this on the color in the cross polars. Um, Ideally, you'd actually include rotations. We'd have a bunch of images and each one would be a different rotation. It's a harder problem. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that, but uh, right now we can just take and say, give me everything that's in the same color nearby and let's call that a grain. Uh, and so how do we do that? This is a problem that shows up in a lot of other settings too. We might have, um, you know, uh, well, Aerial photography or um, you know multispectral data, things like Landsat Sentinel, that's one one case. Um, but other cases might be uh, there's a lot of different uh, geophysical data where this pops up, and then obviously things like core photographs. You might be trying to identify you know uh, individual class uh, in some fairly coarse section, um, maybe burrows or concretions. Uh, so this sort of thing can pop up a lot. It's a notoriously difficult problem. And the solutions I'm going to give you are not perfect. Uh, what I'm going to give you, though, is a few methods that are actually kind of cutting edge that work kind of well and are things to think about. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, this same stuff we're going to use here can be applied to anything where you want to say, give me a region based on its color. And uh, the basic idea is that we don't just want to do a strict color classifier, right? You could imagine doing something where you show, okay, give me everything that's purple. And we define that by looking at three, we look at distance from kind of three values. Now we can do this in other spaces, but simple space, we have a red, green, blue value. We'd say, okay, the red, green, blue here, that's like 
153, 88, 153. Okay, whatever. I'm moving a little bit and it's changing. Let me zoom in. Um, we could do that by looking at distances in each band for those colors. But then what about these things? We're gonna, we're gonna kind of get all these little like fractures. This is the grain we care about. We, we wanna leave out this other, you know, we don't wanna over classify this other stuff. So it's, it's a fuzzy problem. And it's where you wanna use spatial information and not just color information. And that's the key to this. If you just care about color information, there are simpler ways. This is gonna take the fuzziness into account. All right, so let's, let's uh, move on a little bit and start looking at nuts and bolts of this. Let's just take a little section. This is so I don't crash my laptop. <laughs> it's also because it's a little easier to work with, but I just extracted kind of the center of this. This is this area right in here. Um, and we're just gonna work with that. It's just to make it a little easier. Okay, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna apply a pretty fancy, pretty cutting edge uh, method. And this is to get this fuzzy part in. Before I mentioned, you know, we could take the, look for everything that's purple, classify, give me all the purple grains. That, that's something you can do. It, it will work, uh, but it'll give you, you'll leave out everything that's another color. What we would prefer to do is say, give me all the regions, let's group regions that are similar colors. And the idea behind that, this group, rate, group regions into similar colors um, is something called super pixels. So uh, super pixels are regions that are similar colors that we can treat as, a, as the same thing. And that's the term from image processing. Uh, it's a pretty simple concept. Um, and there's a ton of different ways to do it. There's watershed approaches. There's like this whole category of functions. We're gonna use one that's become pretty popular later, lately. It's based on k-means clustering. It's called slick, simple iterative, liter, simple linear iterative clustering. All it is, if you're familiar with k-means, it takes k-means. So we're finding, you know, uh, clusters, but it's using the color information. So red, green, blue and then the spatial information, X and Y. So we've got five dimensional K-means clustering with a much lower weight on spatial stuff. So we're gonna find stuff that's clustered here. We're gonna find a whole bunch of different clusters and that can be projected kind of back into the image space, if that makes sense. That's all it is, five dimensional K-means clustering. That's what Slick is. Um, it actually kind of works okay. It's not perfect, but it's okay. Let me jump to the question that was just asked. It's a good one. And that's how would I classify pores and say, do a porosity calculation. Uh, so for most of you who are uh, familiar with staining, so the, the ideal case is that you get a stained thin section. Uh, and then you do this very simple thing where you show, give me everything that's blue and you count up the number of things that are blue. And that's your, your porosity. Uh, and that's why stained thin sections are used. It's a very simple, quick way because you can say everything that's blue in the, the, the plane polarized light gives me um, the pores, because those are the only things that would absorb the dye. And then we can just get the area of all those blue pixels, essentially. That's the easy way. The harder way is when you don't have the stain thin section. And in that case, you know, this is this much harder problem of trying to classify uh, the different minerals. And so you would run some sort of classification uh, that would try to classify pore versus rock grains. And that's very easy in some rocks and actually much harder in others. Uh, but that's what you do. You try to find some sort of classification based on, um, it's usually based on the colors in, um, in cross polarized light and rotating it. So you can feed all this in, you can take a bunch of photographs automatically. Um, there's some other, there's a lot of different ways to approach it. And I'm, I, the people I should do muscrospy are laughing at me right now. But um, the, the idea is the pores are pretty obvious once you start uh, particularly when you start rotating the stage around and cross polarized light because they'll always have the same color. Um, and then you can use that automatically. Uh, you can actually extract, take a bunch of images. This is the hard way, again, uh, take a bunch of images and stack them up. The issue there is that that doesn't always work because sometimes your pores are filled and you know you may be looking at things where it's more, we wanna find calcite filled pores. Uh, those aren't porosity, but it is still uh, not part of the grain. So you may be doing more fancy things there, but the idea is always the same. You're going back to finding some sort of classification method that can distinguish pore from the stuff that you're not interested in. And then once you have that, it's pretty easy to work with. The hard part is finding a way that works. Um, so yeah, uh, I would point you to some people who, <laughs> who actually do that and know more about it than I do because um, my uh, petrology classes were 20 years ago and <laughs> I am not the best uh, person to comment on detailed methods. Uh, but let's go ahead and run this. So this is this uh, five-dimensional k-means clustering. 
And what we're going to do is find regions that are fuzzily the same color. And uh, this is going to take a bit to run. It's, it's not a very fast technique. Um, it's faster than a lot of the others, though. And that's one of the, the downsides to any of these sort of fuzzy grouping methods is they're fundamentally very slow. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Nope, what do we have here? Oh, you know what? What environment am I in? <laughs> okay, tell you what, give me two seconds. Because we're in a place where it's pretty easy to stop, I'm going to uh, switch Conda environments. Uh, I am actually using one feature here, the start label, um, to make things a little easier. I won't get into exactly what that is, but that was uh, added in a slightly recent version of uh, of socket image, and I have the wrong conda environment active. So this is only going to take a second, but it will take a second. Um, I'm going to switch out. While we're doing this, I'm just going to keep talking about uh, what we were doing there. So we're applying the slick uh, operator, and that has, uh, yeah, hold on a second. Okay, so that has a few different parameters, and those parameters are a sigma. Uh, very similar to Gaussian gradient magnitude, and that's going to control how much of a region it's looking at. And then it has a couple of weights on how much it should care about spatial adjacency versus color similarity. Um, and those are kind of the two things that you'll tune. The spatial weights, the higher weight you put on spatial weighting, the, the, the X and Y, the tighter clusters, the smaller grains you'll get. Um, the lower weight you put on it, the more discontinuous and more you know, crazy the regions will look. So it's kind of a way of controlling the size of features you're getting and you know, how, uh, how much you care about the similarity. Uh, so we're just gonna go through and do this. And we should be back to the point where I realized I was running the wrong versions of things. So this will take a second to run. But that's these two things. Uh, the sigma is, all right, yeah, if you have the start label error, what you can do, um, you can just basically remove the start label part. So if anyone's getting it, just do this. It'll be good enough for what we need to do. Uh, so, you know, that should actually work. And why am I calling mark boundaries? Okay, well, hmm, that's odd. At any rate, if you remove it, that, that should be okay. So we're gonna let this thing run here. Um, the mark boundaries part, uh, you'll, you'll see why I had the start label in there in a second. Um, yeah, it's not gonna matter for this. Okay, the start label has to do with filtering out the background. Um, so basically in this case, if we had used a full image, the start label would be more relevant. I probably should have just taken it out to begin with. And so I do apologize for having that error there. Um, it's not kind of ideal, but it won't matter for, for what we're doing where we don't have the background. Um, and back to these, the sigma, again, it's a blurring. So we apply a, a Gaussian filter before we do this. We wanna like filter out, blur the image a bit, get colors that are similar nearby. In segments is the number of grains. Uh, so this is saying, find me 1,500 clusters. So about three, it's going to find 1,500 grains. Whether or not there are 1,500 grains in the image, it's going to find 1,500 you know, things that are similar. So that's one of the big knobs to turn. And then compactness is basically how much we're going to let the grain uh, vary through space. So uh, those are the three knobs you have to turn. And it's, it's kind of interesting to play with these. But let's go ahead and look at what we got. Um, you know, this is not bad. We actually outlined a lot of the grains. Now in places, it connected all this up into one grain. That's that's really not ideal, but it got these very well. Um, it connected those together, but it got that one pretty well. You know, it's, it's not perfect. Um, we could tune this. We could try to do a better job, but you can see that it is actually picking out real grain boundaries, and it's doing a, a not awful job of, of getting um, the main, the large, obvious grains. Uh, you can see it through here. It's not doing a perfect job, but it is generally matching uh, a lot of the green boundaries and getting kind of the right orientations. So let's tune this a bit. Now I'm not going to show going through it because it takes so long to run, but I'm going to tune the sigma in segments and compactness values a little. And that's going to be here. So it, basically I'm running them, um, you know, with these same settings, but that's a, a pretty reasonable amount. 
what we're going to do is actually look at the orientations. So if you look at this, this thin section, let's, let's scroll back up to the, well, let's, yeah, the, the plane polars are good. What you see is we do have some foliation in this thin section, right? We have a slight shape preferred orientation to these grains. You can see we have amphiboles elongated kind of, you know, up, down, uh, consistently oriented that way. So there, there is some shape preferred orientation to this. There is a fabric to it, a bit of foliation. Um, it's kind of an amphib light, so that's not surprising. But let's quantify that. You know, let's look at the shape preferred orientation. Let's see what the orientation is. And we could also say things about what's the ratio or what's the size of the grains. We can look at that. Once we've done this boundaries, we, we've classified these grains, um, we can start to get parameters about them. So things like their shape, their orientation, um, you know, their, their long axis to short axis, all that is, is possible once we've got the classification done. So let's go ahead and do something like that. We're gonna run the same thing we just did. So that's everything we've been doing so far. Well, mark boundaries. This is just to make it easy to see. Uh, the segmentation gives you individual grains with like unique values. So everything inside that yellow blob might have a value of one, the other one might have a value of two. But the, the mark boundaries just makes them in yellow so it's easier to see. Um, region props is an image in scikit image that, that just, or a function in scikit image that tells you a few interesting uh, tidbits. So uh, what we might look at is the orientation. So when we look at the moment of inertia of an image, there's actually a lot of ways to do moments of inertia in images very efficiently. And what I mean by that, if we classify a region, we have this elongate blob where it's all ones inside it and all zeros outside. Um, we can define the image moments. And what that gives us is the orientation of the long axis, the orientation of the short axis, and the ratio of those two. And that's the inertia tensor. It's what's called in socket image. It's called image moments elsewhere, um, same idea. But we can turn that immediately into, it gives us basically a covariance matrix that we can turn into uh, a direction. And it gives us other information if we want it. So we could look at ratios, long axis to short axis, how, how asymmetric are the grains. Um, but we're just, just gonna do angles. We're just gonna make a rose diagram out of it. And we're just gonna show that. So let's run it. And it'll take a bit. Like I said, it is slow. <laughs> uh, that's one of the downsides to using some of these fancier methods. They can quickly get slow. But here we have it. We've tried to identify a bunch of grains. We've done an okay-ish job, not a great job, but enough job, enough good enough job to see they actually do have a long axis and a short axis. Um, and it's mostly oriented uh, north-south, kind of you know, up down here. And that's basically the distribution of the grains we've identified in terms of their orientation. So all that with not too much code. Um, you know, this inertia tensor thing seems a little magical, but it's actually not. It's taking each one of those segment regions where it all has, say, a value of five. Uh, it's finding just that, and then it's doing some very simple math um, to, it's basically some mathematical tricks. You can get this covariance matrix from some simple uh, summing and, and subtracting and addition, adding and, you know, makes it much simpler uh, from a code perspective. And I'm not, not going to get into that, but yeah, you can also get size um, and get other things. And this is actually a very good question. So uh, the question here is um, when using Slick, uh, do you plot error versus number of clusters to find number of clusters? Like k-means clustering uh, is a good practice. And the answer is that, yeah, you actually probably really should. Um, I've never seen that particular bit used in Slick because uh, people mostly just throw it at it and turn knobs until it works. Um, but in principle, uh, so th there's two things to think about. One is that when you use these methods, you often know a priori that I want about 20 features. And in that case, you probably wouldn't do that tuning. The other option is where you don't know a priori, and that's exactly where this comes in. So the, the question is about, when we use k-means clustering, what we can do is we can, so k-means clustering finds n clusters, k clusters, um, and it moves basically things around until we get a, a you know low spread. We basically try to move to the center of a cluster and say, okay, we've stopped, we, we're not changing in, in moving this point does not give me a better distribution. And it just moves those points around a little bit, trying to get better and then stops once it's not changing much. That's how it works. Uh, so you have a number set beforehand and you can look at your error. Your error is how uh, distributed those 
points are essentially. Are we doing a good job of getting a tight cluster or is it a big loose cluster? And so the more K values, the more clusters you try to find, the more that's going to go down. Um, but you're going to have kind of an elbow. That's a very common thing with training these. So if we have a lot of clusters, we know we're going to get a very good result, but is that actually meaningful? So you look for where that rate of change really starts to kind of, you know, uh, get an inflection point. And that's a very common and very good practice. I have never actually seen that used for slick at all. And I don't really know why I, I think, you know, most people just do it until it works. So you, you turn the knobs until you get the visual result you're looking for, but, um, a more proper way would be to do that. Um, if you wanted to do that, you'd need to dig under the uh, under the hood just a little because you don't really get the individual um, information you'd need uh, with with uh, the slick function exposed in socket image. But you could code one up; it wouldn't be too hard. Yeah, it's a great question, uh, and that's maybe not the best answer, but hopefully it, it helped. Um, yeah, we're on to questions now. This is essentially wrapping it up. Um, so the next part of this, uh, I'm gonna take a bit of a break, and I know a lot of y'all are in you know time zones where it's it's midnight or past midnight, so it's up to y'all if you want to hang around. But um, I'll be available for for a couple more hours, and we can work on you know, your own data. I can answer questions that comes up. Um, I do have some suggestions if people are looking for data. There's some of the tutorial, and I'll walk through that in a second. But uh, I want to thank everybody. I want to particularly thank uh, Nordic Center Research Group again, and Val and, and, uh, and other folks for hosting this. It's been a uh, real honor to come here and give this tutorial. And uh, hopefully, despite all my technical difficulties, I didn't <laughs> completely mess things up. No, um, you didn't. That was brilliant. That was very, very cool. Yeah, I hope it was useful. So if y'all are OK with it, why don't we take a break and then start the, the more interactive portion? Yes. And uh, so before we start the more interactive portion, if everybody could uh, just please thank Joe for uh, the work he's done for us today. So, um, you know, you might just clap on Zoom or, you know, send a <laughs> message or uh, whatever. But, uh, you know, thank you so, uh, so very much. That was great.